Okay, we're on the record on case CR 22-211624, State of Idaho v. Lori Noreen Vallow. This is the continuation of the state's case in chief at jury trial. I just met with counsel in chambers to discuss a few issues that have come up and believe we're ready to get started with additional evidence this morning. I'll note the state's here represented by the prosecutors and the defense as well as the defendant are all present today. Remind everyone that's in attendance to continue to please comply with the court's conduct order as it relates to both this courtroom and the remote viewing locations in Ada and Madison County. And among the items in that order are prohibition against any use of a device to record, photograph, or transmit any sounds, images, or videos from these proceedings. So with that, I think we're ready to have the jurors brought in and get started with additional testimony. Is the state ready to proceed this morning? Yes, Your Honor. Is the defense ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. All right. And I believe Mr. Balance was continuing to testify on direct. Is that correct? Yes, we'll bring him in. Okay. We'll go ahead and have the jurors brought in as well. All right, please. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All right. We're concluding with testimony from Mr. Balance, who was previously placed under oath yesterday and is in direct examination with Mr. Wood conducting the direct. The court notes all the jurors are present and accounted for and would note on the record also they've all signed their juror affirmation. So we appreciate your continued service. With that in mind, Mr. Wood, if you'd like to continue with your direct examination, you can. Thank you. Your Honor, I'd ask the witness be hand what's been marked as State's Exhibit 156A. I do have a courtesy copy electronically for the court as well. Mr. Balance, can you quickly review State's Exhibit 156A? Do you recognize State's 156A? What is it? Hold on. I think that microphone is not turned on, it would appear. Okay. What is State's 156A? This is the full copy of my report that I completed in this matter. Okay. Is that a true and accurate representation of that report? Yes, sir, it is. Your Honor, based on the request of the defense, I would move to admit State's Exhibit 156A as the true and full copy of Mr. Balance's report. All right. I'll note, to clarify the record then, 156 was admitted yesterday, which under Rule 1006 was a summary. The defense requested the entirety of the report, and that's now apparently been submitted. Did you have time to review that, Mr. Thomas? Yes, Your Honor. I'll agree to it. Okay. So Exhibit 156A is now admitted. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. 
I may continue publishing to the jury from 156. You may. Agent Balance, do you recognize page 26? Yes, I do. Is this the page that we finished on yesterday? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. And just to uh, get back into your testimony, can you just briefly summarize again what was found on page 26? Yes, sir. So this is looking at Google location history for Homer J. Maximus at Gmail, at that account, um, which was associated with Alex Cox and then looking at multiple locations from the Google location history record. Okay. Agent, can you tell us what's, uh, what you found and reported on page 27 of your report? Sure. So this is looking at records for the 0143 cell phone that was associated with Chad Daybell and looking at different interactions that it had with this tower and sector. So we're looking at from the call box here, between 1035 and 1220, there's multiple SMS or text messages that are exchanged with 46, the number ending 4652, which was associated with Lori Vallow. And then there's also an outgoing call to Lori Vallow that occurs at 1145 and 55 seconds. And that's on the morning of September 9th? Yes, sir, that's correct. Uh, Agent, we, while we're talking about uh, these interactions, uh, were you asked in your report, when you prepared a report by law enforcement, to focus on specific dates? Yes, I was. Okay. Um, and in doing your investigation, did you look at other dates as well? I did. Was it common for the numbers between... Chad Daybell, attributable to Chad Daybell, and the numbers attributed to Lori Vallow, did they communicate frequently? They did. Okay, thank you. So even on the dates not mentioned in this report, they communicated frequently? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. If you can finish what you were explaining to the jury about uh, slide 27. So the only other thing I would point out is, again, we talked about it yesterday, but this is representative of Chad Daybell's residence by the green icon here. Okay. So his, his cell phone was being serviced by the, the tower located in St. Anthony at the time? Correct. Okay. And that would provide coverage to the Daybell residence. What did you find in report in slide 30? So this was going back to looking at the Google location history for the Homer J. Maximus account associated with Alex Cox. And so if you look, it's going to be between 1142 and 1147, so a shorter time window. But there's two location points here at 1142 and 1145, just north of the Daybell residence. And then the next one that we see is at 1146 and then 1147, which would be consistent with that device leaving the area of the Daybell residence traveling south towards Rexburg. Okay. And just as a, as a brief refresher, the, the blue pointer, what kind of geolocation data is that? Sure. So... Basically, on the Google location record from what we talked about yesterday, you'll see the type of how it's being reported to Google. So we see a GPS, which is represented with red, and then we see the blue, which would be representative of a Wi-Fi report. Okay. Of a Wi-Fi report. Okay. So between slides 26 and 30, uh, can you just briefly summarize where the phone, the phone attributable to Alex Cox's Homer J. Maximus account was located? In the vicinity of the Chad Daybell residence. 
what did you refine what did you find and report on slide 31 so this page is showing three different accounts or phone numbers and what tower and sectors those were utilizing so the three numbers are at the top 0143 which would be attributed to Chad Daybell 9120 which would be attributed to Alex Cox and then 4652 which would be attributed to Lori Ballow. So the interaction here is going to be associated with 0143. That's an outgoing call to 4652 at 1145 and 55 seconds. And then down here, you can see the other side of that call where it's being received by the 4652 phone from the 0143. Additionally, you see an outgoing call from 9120, which would be attributed to Alex Cox, also to 4652. And then you can see it being received down here by the 4652 phone. So basically what that's saying is, during the call made by the 0143 phone attributed to Chad Daybell, it was using a tower that would provide coverage to the Daybell residents. At the time 9120 makes the call to 4652, it would also be utilizing a tower that would provide coverage to the Daybell residents. And then finally down here, 4652, when it's receiving those two calls, would be utilizing a tower that would provide coverage to Rexburg. And all these calls were taking place shortly after the phone attributable to Alex Cox left the Daybell residence, correct? That's correct. What did you find and report on slide 34? So again, this is a short duration, but we're looking at 0143 for uh, towers and sectors that were utilized for two different interactions. One, an incoming SMS from 4652. The other is an outgoing SMS to 4652, utilizing the first tower would be up providing coverage to the Daybell residents. Then this tower down here when I looked at the drive test data associated with it, does provide coverage all the way up to the Daybell residents. So when I spoke yesterday, when you're looking at two different towers that are being utilized within close proximity and time, like this one, where you have approximately a little over a minute, you the phone would need to be near an area where there's overlapping coverage associated with both of those towers and sectors. And what did you find and report on slide 36? So this is a few minutes later, the 0143 phone attributed to Chad Daybell receiving an incoming SMS using a tower that would provide coverage down to Rexburg. Looking at the drive test data of that particular tower, that tower would not provide coverage up to the Daybell residence. So at this point, the that phone attributable to Chad Daybell is within the coverage of that tower, but not within the coverage of the tower that provides coverage to his home? Correct. So if you look between this page and the one previous, you'll see that this tower is slightly west of the tower that was utilized during the previous interaction on um, page 35 of the report. What did you find and report on slide 38? Okay, so this is going to show interactions between three different numbers, 0143, attributed to Chad Daybell, 9120, attributed to Alex Cox, and 4652, attributed to Lori Vallow, between 1243 and 1249. So to start with the 0143, you see an outgoing and an incoming SMS utilizing this tower and sector. And then since both 9120 and 4652 were Verizon phones. They're going to be utilizing the same tower and sector. So you can see both the black and the blue are represented here if utilizing that same tower and sector. And so basically what this is showing is these towers are utilizing, or these phones are utilizing towers and sectors with an overlapping coverage area down in Rexburg. And this was again on September 9th? That is correct, September 9th from 1243 to 1249 p.m. Okay. 
Agent, can you tell us what you found and reported on slide 42? Yes. So this was a second date that I was asked to analyze and determine if there was any information that could indicate general locations of phones. And this was September the 23rd of 2019. So we're looking at a time period from 3.59 in the morning until 8.35 in the morning and looking at tower interactions by 0143, which would be attributed to Chad Daybell. So basically there's numerous outgoing SMS messages and one incoming SMS or text message that occur during that time window, starting at 359 and then going to 834 in the morning. And those were all with 4652, a phone that was attributed to Lori Vallow. What did you find and report on slide 43? So this was from Google location history for Homer J. Maximus at Gmail, which was associated with Alex Cox between 9.01 in the morning and 9.41 in the morning. And the locates all repeat with a 15 meter margin of error consistent with that device being Alex Cox's residence. And so just can you just remind again what the, the yellow circle with the R means? Certainly. So the yellow circle is the margin of error. So when we see here, all of these have a margin of error of 15 meters. So that yellow circle is representative of what 15 meters looks like for that margin of error. And what did you find in report on slide 44? So this is looking at a tower interaction of 9374, which was attributed to Chad Daybell. And this shows an outgoing call to 9120, which was attributed to Alex Cox. And that during that time, this is a, the 9374 is a Verizon phone, unlike the previous orange tower and sector we've seen up here. So it would be utilizing a different tower and sector since it's a different network. And so this tower and sector does provide coverage to the Daybell residents. And what did you find and report on slide 47? So this is looking at interactions for two different phones, 0143, the Ch number attributed to Chad Daybell, and then 4652 attributed to Lori Vallow between, on September the 23rd, 2019 between 927 and 937 and basically shows the 0143 number utilizing three different towers and shows the different activity. So specifically to this tower, we see outgoing call, an outgoing text message, and an incoming text message. All of those are with exchanged with 4652. We see an outgoing call with 4652 on this tower and sector. And then we see an incoming SMS from 4652 on this tower and sector. And again, what date was this? This is September the 23rd, 2019. Okay, so that upper right hand box, those are uh, three calls between a phone attributable to Chad Daybell and a phone attributable to Lori Vallow, correct? That's correct. And uh, and those all take place between 9.30 and 9.35? And nine, yeah, correct. Okay. Um, and there's then in the, the box to the left, there's another call. That's correct. In those same phones at 9.36? Correct. Okay. Uh, that bottom box. So that's showing the tower and sector utilized by 4652 during that time range. And you see two of the calls here being in communication with 0143. Okay. So that, that's representative of those other calls that we that are discussed above? Yes, correct. Okay, but just from another tower? Yes, correct. All right. And this, again, September 23rd between 927 and 937 a.m.? That's correct.
What did you find in report on slide 48? This is looking specific to Google location history for Homer J. Maximus associated with Alex Cox, showing between 945 and 949 that the device reporting to that Google account moved from the area down here in Rexburg near Alex Cox's residence north. So if we can go to uh, the bottom box in purple, what does that represent? So this represents a Google location. The type is going to be Wi-Fi, and then the margin of error is 100 meters. And so when I talked yesterday about if you put every single date, time, margin of error, and latitude, longitude on every single one of these, it makes a map that's difficult to read. So instead, what you're looking at is a summary box over here to where you have one Wi-Fi location and 10 GPS locations. The margin of error for the Wi-Fi is the 100 meters reported here, and then three to seven meters for the GPS locations that are reported going north. And so basically, the two times that are reported here and here are more of a bookend showing the start and the end of this particular page and what I'm representing with this time period. Okay, so to summarize, on September 23rd, Alex, uh, a phone attributable to Alex Cox uh, is within 100 <coughs> meters of, well, I don't want to misstate that, is within 100 meters of that Wi-Fi signal in the general location of Lori Vallow's apartment, correct? That's correct, just northwest of where just, the apartment is. Just northwest of it. Uh, and then by 949, um, He's moving up what looks to be Highway 20, uh, and there he's being pinged by GPS 10 times. So basically, um, not to correct you, but a ping would be basically something to where the carrier or company sent out a request for okay. a location. This isn't a ping. This is basically looking at a location that was reported. So in essence, there's no request from the company to locate where the device is. This is just stored information of where it is. And so during that time window, everything else you said is correct, that the phone is moving north and at 949 is indicating consistent with it being on Highway 20 with a three-meter margin of error. Okay, and that's September 23rd? Correct. Was that a date you were asked to specifically look at? Yes, it was. Um, why was that? Uh, that was a date that was indicated um, that potentially there was um, an event that occurred in the investigation, and that was based off of what investigators were looking at of last known times whenever um, J.J. Ballow was alive. Okay. So, and just to make sure I don't speak incorrectly, a ping is when the cell company sends out a signal. Correct. So say, for instance, I can give a pretty good example for it. If we were looking for a missing person that had went hiking in the woods, we can request that the cell phone carrier ping the phone to determine its location of where it is now. And so they're initiating on their network a request to locate versus looking at historical records that are already maintained by the provider. Okay, thanks. What did you find and report on slide 49? So these are from the Google location history for Homer J. Maximus at Gmail, which was attributed to Alex Cox, and looking at different locations that were reported around the Chad Daybell residence on September 23rd, 2019, between 9.55 and 10.12 or 10.13. Uh, can you walk us through those as they occurred chronologically? Yes. So the first one that we see is going to be at 9.55 and 6 seconds, which is going to be a 50-meter margin of error showing the center point just northwest of the Daybell residence. And then we see at 9.56 a much smaller margin of error with a GPS hit of 4 meters, and that's again at 9.56 and that is an area kind of just northeast of a small pond. And then we see the next one, 957, a much larger margin of error via Wi-Fi 
um, which shows 100 meters centered here, kind of in the middle of the yard. And then next we see 1002, another very small margin of error of 3 meters GPS and indicating a close proximity to the location where JJ Vallow was located. Beyond that, we see additionals at 1005, 1007, and 1012, anywhere from 28 meters to 60 or 92 meters margin of error. Um, the last one that we see shown in this particular page is at 1012 and 42 seconds. Okay. So to summarize, on September 23rd, 2019, between 9.55 and 10.12, a phone attributable to Alex Cox uh, was located at those spots on Chad Daybell's residence. That's correct. What did you find and report on slide 51? So this is looking at network interactions with 0143 attributed to Chad Daybell between on September 23rd, 2019, between 9.30 in the morning and 10.27 in the morning. This shows the use of two different towers and sectors. And I can go through each box. Um, there's an outgoing call to 4652 attributed to Lori Vallow. And everything in this box looks like it's going to be the same um, interactions with 4652 to include outgoing and, ingo outgoing and incoming text messages as well as outgoing calls. And then the same thing over here. Um, there is one number that I don't recognize, but 4652 has two interactions with the 0143 phone at 936 and 1026. So the other thing I'll point out is that, as you can see, this is at, we have 936, an interaction with this tower. We have 935, an interaction with this tower. So that's when I talked about yesterday to where when a phone is utilizing two different towers and sectors, we can look at that phone is likely located very near to the overlapping coverage area versus being all the way up here in St. Anthony and then one minute later being down here closer to this particular tower and sector. So what I looked at with the drive test, which was mapped on one of the pages yesterday, is that the overlapping coverage of these two towers and sectors includes the Chad Daybell residence. Okay. Chad Daybell residence. Yes, ma'am. And so in that box on the right, you have between 930 and 1016, I count eight communications between a phone attributable to Chad and a phone attributable to Lori? Yes, that's what I count as well. Okay. And then on the box at the left, uh, between 936 and 1026? I count two. There are two. Okay. What did you find and report on slide 54? So this is Google location history attributed to Homer J. Maximus at Gmail, associated with Alex Cox, on September the 23rd from 10.12 in the morning until 10.20 in the morning. The locate we have at 10.12 reported to Google shows it in the vicinity of the Chad Daybell residence. And then the next one that we see at 10.20 shows it down closer towards Rexburg, consistent with movement away from the Daybell residence, going south towards Rexburg. And that 10, 12, 42, had you already put that on a, and let me, let me clarify that, in the upper box, um, that finding, was that on one of the previous slides? Yes, I believe it was. It was the last, uh, location of that phone of the Homer the phone attributable to Homer J Maximus and Alex Cox on Chad Daybell's residence that morning correct that's correct okay and so then about eight minutes later he's south down in the Rexburg area that's correct or I should say that phone is down south in the Rexburg area correct What did you find and report on slide 55? 
Okay, so this is looking at three different phones and the interactions that they have with the network. 4652, which would be attributed to Lori Vallow. 9120, attributed to Alex Cox. And 0143, attributed to Chad Daybell. So starting with the interactions that the 0143 phone had, there were three outgoing SMS messages that were sent, um, all of them at 1016. Then we see the 9120 phone, that it makes an outgoing call to the 4652 phone. And then this is showing the 4652 phone receiving that call at 1013. And then the duration of that call was 545 seconds. So for the 515, 4020, and 43, and the 9120 phone, both of those are using towers that would provide coverage to the Daybell residents. And then the 4652 phone is utilizing a tower and sector that would provide coverage to down in Rexburg to include uh, Lori Vallow's residence. Okay, so and just to, to clarify then, in that upper box, you have three messages within a minute from a phone attributable to Chad Daybell to Lori Vallow at 1016 the morning of September 23? That's correct. Okay, and then the middle box is a phone attributable to Alex Cox on a 545-second phone call with a phone attributable to Lori Vallow. That's correct. And that's at 1013. Correct in the morning? Correct. Okay. Um, and then that bottom box is reflective of that same call? Yes, it is. From, uh, from the uh, call detail records of the phone attributable to Lori. Correct. Okay. Uh, we've been talking about um, Alex, uh, these those specific dates, uh, September 9th and September 23rd, that you were asked to look at, uh, and on both those occasions, Alex Cox's phone shows up on Chad Daybell's residence. Did you look at any other times where uh, the Homer J. Maximus account or a phone at associated with it was found on Chad Daybell's residence? I did. Uh, what did you find? So I found that that phone did go to the Chad Daybell residence on other occasions. Um, the, num the exact number escapes me. It was definitely less than 10. Um, did you ever find another time where the location given was in the backyard? So specific to the Google location, as you've seen already, there's a margin of error associated with each particular locate that you see. So on some of those other dates, I did see where the margin of error included the backyard. I didn't see any time where there was a locate that was a very small margin of error that only included the backyard. Yeah. Thank you. Agent, what did you find and report on slide 59? So this was looking at the Google location history for Homer J. Maximus associated with Alex Cox on October the 8th, 2019, between 2.59 p.m. and 3.37 p.m., which was consistent with that phone visiting the Walmart in Rexburg, which the satellite <laughs> photo shows it under construction, but it had been completed at the time that these locates were recorded. Okay. So were they, it looks like there was one GPS hit and the rest were Wi-Fi? That's correct. So you'll see similar to one of the earlier pages to where I will do basically what I would call bookending of taking the first record that I have in this time window and the last record and showing those two specifically, but then also including the summary box, which shows that there's a total of 18 Wi-Fi locations reported during that time window. That's the Walmart in Rexburg, Idaho? That's correct. On October 8th? That's correct. What did you find and report on slide 60? So as a part of looking at the different records that we received that we're asked to review in a case, um, Verizon is one carrier that maintains a 
short retention period for the content of text messages. So upon reviewing that, I saw two different text messages that were associated with the 9374 phone attributed to Chad Daybell. And so the content of those messages were the first one, going to stop by the store right now to get that other number working. Hopefully it won't take long. And then the second one was, I will call right now from a 401 number. So when we look at these different records, a lot of times one of the biggest tasks we have is to take whatever time zone a particular record is reported in and convert it to the local time. So here, these records are going to be listed in Eastern Daylight Time, and so they were converted to Idaho local time. So this one at the top, that occurs at 9.57 in the morning, and then the second message occurs at 10.26 in the, 10 in the morning, Idaho time. Are you able to tell from that data uh, who the text message was sent to? I am. So if you look at the terminating number here, you'll see 808-755-5452, and that's the same on both of those text messages. And do you know who that number is attributable to? I have that number attributed to Lori Vallow. Okay. And that was from, it was from... Six nine zero nine three seven four attributable to Chad Daybell, correct? That's correct. On the ninth of October. That's correct. And what did you find in report in slide sixty one? So what I found here was first I'll t point out the location of WR, which was Wireless Revolution. LLC, which was a store that sold um, devices that could be used on AT&T's network. So then we're looking at network interactions between 9374, attributed to Chad Daybell, and then 8260, attributed to Chad Daybell as well. And so what we see is which towers and sectors were being utilized in close proximity to the time of the messages that were sent, shown in the previous page. So here... At 1027 in the morning, this would be representative of the blue tower and sector. 8260 has a voice call with the number ending 5452. And then this tower and sector is utilized by 9374. And it's a voice call to a number that I don't recognize as part of my report. Okay. And that vo uh, the voice call in, in the blue box between the 401 number and the 5452 number, how long was that after the text that was sent in the previous slide? Do you recall? I don't recall the exact timestamp of the previous. So looking at it now, that would be it's showing 1226. Again, that's in Eastern time. So it would be 1026 and 35 seconds. And then 1027 and 14 seconds when that call is made. Okay. And so just to, for clarification, what does the text say in that bottom box? It says, I will call right now from a 401 number. Okay, and that was at 1026? Correct, 1026 and 35 seconds. And then at 1027, there's a, a call from a 401 number to that same number attributable to Lori Vallow, correct? That's correct. And that 401... Five six nine eight two six zero number. Who is that attributable to? Chad Daybell. Thank you. That's on October 9th. That's correct. What did you find and report on slide sixty five? So this was just additional reporting of nine three seven four attributed to Chad Daybell and eight two six zero also attributed to Chad Daybell. And so what I'm looking at here is date and times and usage of the network. And if those phones appear, to, it's whether it's consistent with those two phones being in the same general location. And so you can see there's the blue tower and sector here as well as here. And then there's the green tower and sector here. The green is associated with 9374. 
and then the blue is associated with 8260. Okay, and 8260, is that the number we were just discussing that was activated that day on October 9th? That is correct. Okay. And who is who is that number communicating with in that upper right box? So up here you see an incoming voice call from 4652 attributed <laughs> to Lori Vallow. And then you see multiple text messages exchanged with a number 334-744-4205. And who is that number attributable to? To Alex Cox. Okay. And what time of day are those communications? So we're looking at, from the top, 111 until 222 in the afternoon. Okay. And then in the, oh, 111 to 222 covers the whole, the whole slide, correct? Yes, sir, correct. Okay. Uh, the, the middle box with blue on the right, what is that communication? So that's another representation of an interaction 8260 has with the network, receiving a message from the 4205 number utilizing a different tower and sector. Okay. And then the bottom box. And the bottom is showing um, three outgoing calls, and I don't recognize any of the numbers. Do you recognize the outgoing number? That's, I'm sorry, that's 9374 associated with Chad Daybell. I don't recognize any of the numbers that it's calling. Okay. And in the middle box, who were, I, I don't believe you said who those numbers are attributable to. Yep. So 8260, which would be attributed to Chad Daybell, and 4205 attributed to Alex Cox. Okay. Thank you. What did you find and report on slide 70? So this is looking at Google location history between on October the 9th, 2019, between 12 o'clock p.m. and 1.23 p.m. for the Homer J. Maximus account associated with Alex Cox. And so basically during that time, we see a total of 18 Wi-Fi reports or locations reported via Wi-Fi that would be consistent with that device being at the Lori Ballow residence. Okay, so 18 hits between 12 o'clock and 1.23 p.m. on October 9th? That's correct. Okay. And what did you <coughs> report on slide 72? So this is an extremely short time window of about 32 seconds, but looking at the first one beginning at 1.23 and 0 seconds, consistent with being at Lori Vallow's apartment and showing movement consistent with that device moving over to Alex Cox's residence by 123 and 32 seconds. All right. So just if you'll move us chronologically from each box. So we're starting with 123 and zero seconds, which would be this location here. The second location would be 123 and 16 seconds and then 123 and 32 seconds. Okay, and that's October 9th still? That's correct. And what did you report on slide 73? So again, this is Google location history associated with Homer J. Maximus at Gmail, attributed to Alex Cox between 123 and 237. A total of 28 Google locations are being represented here all consistent with that device being at the Alex Cox residence. Until 2.37 on October 9th. That's correct. And what, you re what did you report on slide 75? So again, this is Google location history for Homer J. Maximus, attributed to Alex Cox, showing movement from 2.42 and 7 seconds south towards Idaho Falls, and another one down in Idaho Falls to end this summary at 314 and 43 seconds. And again, I have a summary box to show that there's a total of eight locations reported during that time window, which would be consistent with that device traveling from Rexburg down to Idaho Falls. Okay, and so your, your start time, if I'm correct, is 242 on October 9th. 2.42 p.m., and that's in Rexburg? Correct. And then the end 
the end time is at 314 uh, in Idaho Falls, where you have it located at SW, which I believe you said stands for Sportsman's Warehouse. That's correct. And without looking at it, that 72-meter margin of error, um, without it being zoomed in, I wouldn't want to say specifically it's located at Sportsman's Warehouse, but definitely in the vicinity. Okay. Thank you. What did you report in slide 76? So this is looking at Google location history again for Homer J. Maximus associated with Alex Cox. On October the 9th from 342 until 412, reporting a total of 18 Google locations via Wi-Fi that show it consistent with that device being located at the Sportsman's Warehouse. Okay. And so just to summarize, on October 9th from 342, to 412, the phone associated with Alex Cox is consistently being located within the sportsman's warehouse. Yes, sir, that's correct. What did you report on slide 77? So this, again, is showing Google location history for Homer J. Maximus attributed to Alex Cox, showing movement starting well, the total window is going to be from 447 to 456, but starting down here at the 447 time frame, the locations here are all going to be GPS, indicating movement consistent with it traveling up towards the Daybell residence and then directly east away from the Daybell residence. Can we just walk us through those boxes chronologically or and those hits? Yes, for sure. So we're looking at 447 down here in the vicinity of Highway 20, and I believe that's Salem Road. The next one that we see is 449, consistent with northbound travel by that device on Salem Road. 451, consistent with it being in the area of the Daybell residence. 455, east from the previous locate, consistent with travel east on, I can't remember the name of this road off the top of my head. Um, but then we're looking at 456 and 7 seconds, which is the final one for this particular page. And so on that final one on that particular page, he's located uh, what looks to be uh, east of the Chad Daybell residence. That's correct. Uh, but on that same, that same road that leads to Chad Daybell's residence. Correct. That would be consistent with the locates that I reviewed. And that was that, that last one, I'm sorry, was it 456? Yes, sir, 456 and seven seconds. Okay, thank you. What did you report on slide 78? So continuing with Google location history for Homer J. Maximus attributed to Alex Cox, the first one represented here we see at 457 via locate via Wi-Fi with a 68 meter margin of error. The next one that we see is at 4.58 and 9 seconds, consistent with the device moving back west. And then the final one that we see is at 5.03 and 55 seconds, which is a GPS. The type is GPS, and it has a 3-meter margin of error. So, and, and to clarify, you, you can't determine the exact route he took to get there? No, I cannot. Okay. Uh, but what you can state is that at 4.58, uh, he's located by GPS on that same road that Chad Daybell's residence is located on. And at 5.03, he is then down uh, just west of Sugar City. That's correct. Okay. And can you just point out Sugar City? Thank you. And... Where is Sugar City in relation to Rexburg? Just north. Okay. Uh, is it fair to say it's somewhat in between Rexburg and Chad Daybell's residence? Yes, sir. And then what did you report on slide 79? So continuing with lo Google location history for Homer J. Maximus associated with Alex Cox, this is looking at a much larger time window between 5.16 p.m., and 11.53 p.m. on October the 9th of 2019, 
a total of 66 locations, and all of those would be consistent with that device being in the area of Alex Cox's residence. And so when we're looking at the two different boxes here, again, that's representing the start and end for the time window that I was looking at. So starting at 516 and 32 seconds, ending at 1153 and nine seconds. Okay, so from that period, 516 on October 9th to 1153, that phone appears to stay at Alex Cox's residence? That's correct. Okay. What did you report on slide 80? So this is looking at network interactions that 8260 had, utilizing two different towers and sec two different towers, um, one northeast of the Daybell residence and one southwest of the Daybell residence. And so looking at the activity specific to each tower and sector, we see numerous text messages exchanged. 8260, which would be attributed to Chad Daybell, and 4652, attributed to Lori Vallow, as well as the number ending 4205, attributed to Alex Cox. Those are between 528 and 1031. And then when we go over to the other tower and sector that was utilized during this time window, we see four outgoing text messages to 4205, which would be attributed to Alex Cox, starting at 713 p.m., and ending at 8.43 p.m. Okay. And was, Oct was October 9th the date you were asked to analyze these records for? I was. And do you know what the significance of that date was? On that date, there was specifically someone who had attempted to um, rob Tammy Daybell, if I remember correctly. Okay. Um, to that box on the left... Uh, what is the first time that the that 401-569-8260 number attributable to Chad messages the 4205 attributed to Alex Cox? So the first time on that was at 713 in two seconds. Okay, and then in the second box, how many times and at what times? Well, let me ask this first. How many times does the phone... The 401-569-8260 attributable to Chad communicate with the 4205 number attributable to Chad, uh, to Alex Cox. So I'm seeing one, two, three, four, five, six times. Okay. And what is the first time in that the box on the right? 7.30 and 10 seconds. And the last time? On the box on the right, the last time for 42.05, I show 10.29 and 4 seconds. Okay. And just to clarify, your times are in military time, correct? Yes, on the call boxes they are. Okay. Is that how that data is reported to you? It is, and it's the easiest way for me to map it out without going back and forth between AM and PM. Okay. Um, but if we look at your heading... That shows these communications all took place on October 9th between 5.28 p.m. and 10.32 p.m. Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. Uh, what did you report on slide 84? So we are looking at October 18th of 2019, between 11.02 in the morning and 12.20 in the afternoon. Google location history for Homer J. Maximus, which would be attributed to Alex Cox. And during that time window, it shows consistently to be at Lori Vallow's residence. And this is October 18th, 2019? Yes, sir. That's correct. And what did you report on slide 85? So this is looking at interactions that 8260 attributed to Chad Daybell had with the network. And sh so I'm showing that there's two outgoing text messages, one incoming. All of those were with the 4652 phone attributed to Lori Vallow.
And what did you report on slide 86? Continuing to look at interactions that 8260 attributed to Chad Daybell had with the network between 136 in the afternoon and 854 in the afternoon on October the 18th, 2019, utilizing two different towers and sectors, both that would provide coverage to the Daybell residents and showing interactions or text messages exchanged between 4652 attributed to Lori Vallow, as well as one outgoing message that goes to 4205 attributed to Alex Cox. And what time was that message at? The message to Alex Cox was sent at 844 and 43 seconds. Okay. And in the box on the left, what does that show? So those are showing um, three text messages exchanged with 4652 and one outgoing call to 4652, which was 2,964 seconds. Okay. Um, and that call was at what time? The call was at 140 and 58 seconds. What did you report on slide 87? So this is continuing with network interactions that 8260 had on October the 18th, 2019, between 9.35 p.m. and 10.55 p.m., utilizing two different towers and sectors. And so specific to this tower and sector here, we see multiple text messages exchanged with 4205 attributed to Alex Cox. And then on this box down here, again, all of the interactions are text messages and exchanged with 4205 attributed to Alex Cox. Both of these towers and sectors would provide coverage to the Chad Daybell residents. Yeah, so between, on October 18th, between 9.35 p.m. and 10.55 p.m., these are all text messages between the, the 401 569 attributable to Chad Daybell and the uh, 4205 number attributed to Alex Cox. Yes, that's correct. Okay, and we see the two different tower uh, signals up there. What What's the significance of that to you? So, again, it goes back to overlapping coverage and which, if you're looking at the interactions only occurred on this tower and sector, then basically that would give me an area that would be representative of the coverage area where that phone would generally be located. But whenever I have two towers and sectors that are used in close proximity and time, then I can look at that. It's more likely that that phone is located in the overlapping coverage areas for both of those towers and sectors. And that specifically includes the Chad Daybell residence. Okay, and how many communications is that in that period between 9.35 and 10.55? So we have nine on this tower and sector here. And if my eyes are working right, I see seven over here. Okay. Agent, did you notice a pattern uh, once that 401 number was activated in between communications with Chad Daybell and Alex Cox and Lori Vallow? I would just note that it had heavy interactions with both phones attributed to both of those persons. Okay. And what does slide 88 represent? So this shows back to Google location history for Homer J. Maximus attributed to Alex Cox on October the 18th, 2019, between 10.05 and 10.07 p.m., which is consistent with movement coming northbound on Salem Road towards Salem Church. The first locate that we see is at 10.05 and 57 seconds with a margin of error of seven meters. The report type is GPS. Then the last one that we see, only about a minute and some change later at 10.07 and 13 seconds. Again, reporting via GPS, 
with a margin of error of 11 meters. And is this within that same time frame that was covered in the last slide? Yes. And that Salem Church, where is that located uh, in relation to Chad Daybell's property? Just south of it. What did you report on slide 89? So this is looking at Google location history again for Homer J. Maximus, attributed to Alex Cox between 1007 and 1045. And so what we see is a total of 13 Google locations, 12 via Wi-Fi, one via GPS. The first one that we see is the, I believe it's gonna be the same one as previously reported on the page prior at 1007 and 13 seconds with a margin of error of 11 meters represented here by the red GPS logo. And then the final one that we see during this time window is at 1045 and 26 seconds, which is a 50 meter margin of error and represented by one of the blue Wi-Fi hits here. Okay. So there were, in the box on the right, I'm sorry, uh, on the box on the right, you're showing uh, the, the last hit in that area? Correct. And that's a Wi-Fi hit. That's correct. Um, and the radius is 50 meters. Yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, and then the, well, he arrived there at 10.07? Or I should say that phone arrived there at 10.07? Correct. The phone arrived at approximately 10.07. Okay. And October 18th, uh, was that another date you were asked to look at? It was. And what is the do you know what the significance of that date is? I do. I know overnight, um, Tammy Daybell was um, found deceased. Okay. So between October 18th and the early morning hours of October 19th. Okay. And so then just to summarize this slide, on October 18th, 2019, a phone attributable to Alex Cox was located at the Salem Church just south of Chad Daybell's residence from 10.07 to 10.45. Yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, can you point out just quickly on this map uh, the Chad Daybell residence and the Salem Church? Yes. So the Chad Daybell residence is represented here in green, and then Salem Church is represented here with SC. Okay. And what did you report on slide 90? This is looking at network interactions between 8260, which would be attributed to Chad Daybell on October the 18th, 2019 between 11.34 and 11.36 p.m. Utilizing this tower and sector here, which provides coverage to the Daybell residence. And there are three outgoing text messages at 11.34, 31 seconds, 11.35 and five seconds, and 11.35 and 28 seconds. All three of those are going to 4652, which is attributed to Lori Valla. Okay. Now, you've, you've probably already answered this, but are you able to look at the content of the messages from those records that you have access to? I'm not. Okay. And what did you report on slide 91? So this is a network interaction of 9120, which is attributed to Alex Cox on October the 18th, 2019 at 11.53 p.m., utilizing this tower and sector, which would provide coverage to kind of southwest Rexburg. And it is an outgoing call of 977 seconds to a number ending 4652, which is attributed to Lori Vallow. Okay. So 977 seconds. Do you know how many minutes that is? Roughly 16 minutes, if I'm doing my math right. Okay. And that was at 11.53 on October 18th? Yes, sir. Correct. Thank you. What did you report on slide 92? So this is showing the other piece of that call, um, the 9120 number calling the 4652 number. 
and the location of the 4652 number at the time, which would have been in Kauai. Um, I'm reporting at the top in Mountain Daylight Time, so that 11.53 p.m., and then the call box here is just showing local time in Hawaii whenever that call was received. So that would be 7.53? That's correct. Okay. Um, and Kauai, I see it's on your slide, but that is an island in Hawaii? Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. And so Lori Vallow's phone on October 18th was at least that phone that ended in 4652 was located in Hawaii. Yes, sir, that's correct. What did you report on slide 93? So this is looking at, and I can tell already that this is going to be incorrect at the top, but this is looking at um, the time around that call. So October the 18th at 11.54 p.m., Google location history associated with Homer J. Maximus attributed to Alex Cox, showing southbound movement consistent with it traveling south on Highway 20 between 11.54 p.m. and then into the next day, October 19th at 12.09 a.m. Okay. Um, so just to be clear at the top, that should say October... 18th. That should say October 18th. And that should say October 19th. Okay. Um, and so at approximately 1154, he hits on a Wi-Fi south of Rexburg. Is that accurate? That's correct. And then at 1209, uh, he is uh, just north of Idaho Falls? Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. Or I should, to be clear, that phone is there. Correct. What did you report on October 22nd? So this is looking at interactions of both the 8260 number attributed to Chad Daybell, as well as the 9374 number attributed to Chad Daybell <coughs> being utilized in Utah. Um, specifically, the tower interactions here are going to be in the area of Springville, Utah. And do you know what the significance of October 22nd is? I don't know if it was the exact date, but I know that there was a burial service for Tammy Daybell around that time. Okay. And so in that top box, uh, the 401-569-8260 number attributable to Chad, who was that phone connect, uh, communicating with? So utilizing this tower and sector, there's three incoming text messages that are received from 4652, which would be attributed to Lori Valla. Okay. And in that box in the middle, who are those communications between? So this is another incoming text message that 8260 has from 4652, attributed to Lori Vallow. Okay. And, and the, I, oh, go ahead. I was just going to continue to the other two. Yeah. So we're looking at the other two interactions 8260 has, which are both outgoing text messages at 402, both to 4652 attributed to Lori Vallow. And then we also see an outgoing call on the 9374 phone attributed to Chad Daybell with a number that I don't recognize. Okay. And what did you report on slide 96? And so this is just a more zoomed in piece of the previous page. And basically what it's showing, I was provided an address for a Holiday Inn, as well as an address for the Evergreen Cemetery. And this is just showing that these towers and sectors that were utilizing, were utilized, excuse me, during that time, would provide coverage to both of those locations. Okay, and are those the same communications as on the previous page? Yes, sir, they are. Okay, just more in detail to show the approximate location by cell tower? Yes, because... Any time that I'm mapping, that's usually the difficulty is you either zoom in too far and it takes away things or you zoom out too far and you can't see specifically um, locations. Okay. And what did you report on slide 102? So this is an interaction with the network of 480-692-9612, which I had attributed to Ty Lee Ryan. 
and it's showing the from the records that I had the last usage of that phone, which is where it's receiving two incoming messages, and that's December the 15th at approximately 12.25 p.m., utilizing a tower out in Kauai. Mm -hmm. And that number is attributable to Tylee Ryan, you said? That's correct. On December 15th? That's correct. One moment, Your Honor. Your Honor, I have no further questions at this time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Mr. Thomas, are you going to be conducting cross? I am, Judge. All right. You can do so. Are you going to take a mid-morning break, or am I going to – I don't want to get cut off in 10 minutes, so – well, you probably get cut off in 15 minutes. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, let's let's start the cross if you don't mind. Oh, and sure. Take a break in about 15. Uh, Special Agent Nick Balance, right? Yes, sir. All right. So what, what does it take to become a special agent? So it's an application process that you put in with the FBI. Um, you'd go through it and typically takes, depending on a particular person's situation, about a year to two years to get through the process. So you start out as just an agent and then you move to a special agent? No, you would start off as a special agent. Oh, What's so special about it? I mean, is it just, you're an FBI agent, is that right? So the correct position is an FBI special agent. There's not an FBI agent position. I got you. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about your background. Where did you, uh, where did you go to school? Where did you go to college? So I went to school in North Carolina at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Okay. Uh, and when did you graduate from there? That would have been in 2007. Okay. And you got your bachelor's degree? Yes, sir. Correct. In, in what? Criminal justice and psychology. And I think you said you worked for the marshals, is that right? For the yeah. U.S. marshals? Yes, sir. That's was that your first job out of college? It was, yes, sir. Okay. And how long were you with them? for approximately nine years. And did you get that job in 2007 when you graduated? Yes, sir, I did. And then you started working for the FBI in 2016? Yes, sir, correct. And you got your special agent, uh, Certification a year later? So I went to Quantico, Virginia, which is where all new agents would go to in 2016, and I graduated in November of 2016. How long is that program? The time I went through, I believe it was 22 or 23 weeks. So about six months, five months? Yes, sir. Okay. And is it... Um, is it like an eight-hour-a-day job type schooling, or what, what kind of hours do you do in Quantico? So they usually run it, I believe, if I remember correctly, again, um, it's eight hours, so anywhere from 7.30 to 4.30. Okay. Uh, and then you started working for the FBI. What, what was your first uh, uh, assignment? What did you do when you first got out? So I was assigned to the Pittsburgh Division and the Charleston, West Virginia Resident Agency. And I guess well, that's helpful, but I kind of wanted to know what, what did you do? Sure. 
So typically our larger field offices will specialize in working in one specific violation just because there's a lot of agents that work at the field office. Anytime you're working in a smaller field office, you just might work multiple violations just because there's less people to work the particular violations. So whenever I started in West Virginia, I was primarily assigned to working white collar investigations and crimes against children investigations. White collar and crimes against children. Um, and when you start out, um, do you have like a caseload, like so many cases that you're assigned? How does that work? Sure, you would be assigned cases and then you can uh, proactively look for cases as well that you can work under the violations that you're working. Okay. So you were assigned out of the Pittsburgh um, office, but to Charleston, uh, West Virginia? Yes, sir, correct. And how many cases did you carry when you were in Charleston at a time? I mean, just Sure. Roughly. Somewhere between probably five and ten. And how long did it generally take to, I mean, I'm not going to say solve the cases, but close the cases, maybe? Sure. So if I'm assigned a case that hasn't been worked at all, so say I'm the first agent that's assigned to that case, mm -hmm. typically you'd look at probably a year or more um, that you would be working that investigation. But there's also cases that an agent was assigned previously and say that person is transferred to another division, is assigned somewhere different. So you can inherit cases as well. So you could inherit a case towards the beginning or something that's already has a conviction and is just waiting on somebody to be sentenced for it. Okay. And so five to ten cases, is that typical throughout the Bureau or just for you? Was that typical for you? I think it would vary significantly depending on what particular squad um, you're looking at throughout the Bureau. Okay. Uh, and then I believe you said you started um, with the CAST uh, group or division in 2019. Is that right? So I started the application process in 2018 and then was fully certified in 2019. And... Um, was this your first case out of uh, being being in the cast group? It was not. It was one of the first, though. Okay. You t you talked a little bit about the training that you had to do, but didn't really get into it as far as the cast goes. Can you tell me a little bit more about uh, the training to become certified member of the cast group? Sure. I don't mean to call it the CAST group. I don't, I don't want to. What, what is it called? So it's a, a cellular analysis survey team. So you'll hear it called CAST team, which is kind of redundant okay. because it already says that. Um, but if you say CAST, I'll know what you're speaking of. Okay. So uh, what is the training involved in becoming part of the CAST team? Sure. So the first training that you would go to would be our basic CAST training. Um, that is one week. And it's looking at under, kind of having an understanding of what records you can obtain from a provider and the ability to take those records and put them onto a map. So one of the biggest pieces of that is learning how to do it without a computer software package. So basically being able to talk a little bit um, about what I mentioned yesterday as far as you take call detail records, which could be printed out. You take a tower list, which also could be printed out. And then you marry those two up, and you're able to say where a tower is located, and then for a specific line in a call detail record, which tower and sector was being utilized. So that's sort of the first. Um, that training can vary. I think right now it's at two days. Um, the second training that we would go to uh, would be advanced. So advanced is a full one week. And when I talked a little bit yesterday about where you have – less and less instructor support um, as these trainings go on for the first three anyway. So by the end of that week, you're basically just given a problem and you're asked to map out that particular case of where phones were during relevant times. And then that's looked at and graded and there's a determination made of whether you would go to the next training. Um, 
the name of that one has changed also over the years. Uh, when I went to it, it was called the field training exercise. So in that training, it's two and a half days as well. And you're basically provided with four different cases that you have to work within a time constraint and you're not able to ask questions about how to do things. So we make a presentation for each one of those. It's graded. And then at that point, um, a determination is made of whether you would continue on to our certification process or whether you would repeat one of those particular trainings to get more time. And did you have to repeat any of these trainings or did you make it through basic, make it through advanced, make it through the field training all in the first try? I took each one time. One time? Yes, okay. sir. And so what's the next step after the field training, two and a half days? So then there's our four-week certification process, which they break up into two two-week trainings. So during the first two-week training, that's whenever we would get instruction from university professors specific to radio frequency theory and how it works. Beyond that, we would meet with the different providers for all of the major phone carriers to include T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T, and at the time, Sprint. So we meet with their legal compliance representatives, which are the ones who maintain the records that I'm speaking about. We also meet with their network engineers who explain how they set up their network and what an optimized network looks like for them. Additionally, we took a trip out to one of the network switches so we can see what that looks like, and that's where all the cell phone towers are connecting to the switch to route calls through their network. Then beyond that, we had a written test for all that information that we learned, um, and that's concluded the first two-week certification. The second two-week certification consisted of learning the drive testing equipment, learning some of the different software packages that we utilize, and then again, taking a case from beginning all the way to end, the end, which included with a moot court exercise where we are basically presenting the case and then challenged by other members that have been in cast for a while to ensure that the methodology we're using is correct. Thanks for bringing up the drive testing. I, I had some questions about that. Um, so. The drive testing, it's not its not a scientific test, right? So it's an industry standard test. It's an industry standard test. Okay. Let's talk a little bit. Well, should I keep going, Judge? Anytime you want to take a break where it's logical. Mr. I'm going to kind of get into some stuff right now. So if we want to take a break, it would be good. Sure. That's fine. Okay. Let's do that. We'll take our uh, mid-morning recess, try to reconvene right around 1030. All right, Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. <coughs> okay, we're back on the record on CR 22211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. Mr. Thomas is conducting cross-examination of the witness, Mr. Balance. You can continue with your cross if you'd like at this time, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Balance, or uh, Special Agent Balance, would you, we were just about to talk a little bit about drive testing. Uh, can you tell me uh, what type of equipment is involved in that? Yeah, so what we're using is what's called a GAR, which is a Gladiator Autonomous Receiver. And basically what that equipment does is it collects the different RF frequencies that are being broadcast by the different cellular providers in a specific area. So in order to take measurements, you would need to drive or move that gear around. Typically, we'll do it with a car. 
And as we drive, it's constantly taking measurements of the different radio frequency that it's detecting with those sensors that it's utilizing. Once we get all of those particular measurements, that's whenever we would take it back into a software mapping program and would look at, and we can basically filter out specific towers and sectors and what that true coverage would look like for each individual one that it detected. And, and, and you said you did this particular test in June of 2020? Yes, sir. That's correct. And how long does that test take? So it depends on the area that we're specifically driving. So if we're just doing one tower and sector, you could feasibly do that in a day. Again, it depends on if you're looking at just a tower and sector that's in downtown Boise, the coverage area probably is not going to go out nearly as far as in a rural area. So we're driving basically to the next tower and a little bit beyond to see how far that coverage goes. When you're talking about a rural area or you're talking about doing an entire city like Rexburg, it took us um, driving better part of a week to complete it. And that was Rexburg, Sugar City, uh, uh, St. Anthony, the whole area that's in your cast report? Correct. That only took you a week to do? Correct. All right. Um, and this Gladiator Autonomous Receiver, is this a piece of equipment that is a government issue or is this something that is uh, in the industry? So it's in the industry. The company that produces is Gladiator. Okay. Uh, I believe you indicated on direct examination uh, that you cannot, you, you, there's no way you could ever uh, be able to tell where a phone was located. 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Correct. What I mean by that is that it depends on we have to have a record in um, from one of the carriers for a specific date and time. So if we don't have a record for a specific date and time, then we're not able to um, estimate a location at that particular date and time. And then on top of that as well, it's dependent on the records. So if we're looking at a tower and sector that provides coverage to a large area, then the area we estimate that that phone is is going to be much larger than certain types of records that we receive, like from the Google location that have a much smaller margin of error. And in this particular case, the sectors are vast, right? I mean, they're huge. There's several towers in this case that have coverage areas that are large, yes. Okay. And so when you're saying that a particular phone is within a particular sector, I mean, that could be 40, 50 square miles, right? It depends on the tower and sector, but it could be a large area. Okay. Let's talk about in this case. How large are these areas? So without having measurements on the map to determine the square area, I mean, I think what you're getting at is that there's a large area. So if you look at particularly that tower that is in St. Anthony, it has coverage that goes down almost into Rexburg. So depending, again, without having, you know, a ruler and being able to map out that exact area, I'll definitely say it's a large area. Okay, so if I was to tell you between St. Anthony and Rexburg, it's about 12 to 15 miles in one direction, just going down the highway. Okay. And would that make sense to say, well, it's probably 12 miles one direction, and then there's also another slice of the pie, which covers – Maybe what uh, another 12, 15, 20 miles square? I mean, again, without looking at it on a map, I don't want to abstractly say what the square mileage would be. Okay. And so when you're, you know, when the prosecutor was uh, examining you and you were, we had all these charts and uh, very Great charts if you know what you're doing and if you know what you're looking at. But for the layperson like me or something, it's a little bit difficult. And so what I, what I want to know is, is there any way to say that based on those charts, based on your readings of those charts and based on your readings of, those, uh, of all that data, uh, that there's any way you can pinpoint to say that anybody was uh, on the Chad Daybell area or in the Chad Daybell um, complex or home homestead uh, without looking at the GPS? So if we're excluding completely the Google location history and we're only looking at the phones, yeah. the best way you would be able to tell whether or not a device was near the Chad Daybell residence is whenever you have two different towers and sectors being utilized in close proximity and time 
and they have overlapping coverage. It still would not, in my opinion, be able to tell you that it was at the Chad Daybell residence. It would only be able to, you would only be able to say that it's consistent with it being at the Chad Daybell residence, but it also could be in any of those overlapping areas that appear on the map. So would that be considered triangulation or when you're using cell towers to triangulate to try to find where a person is or where a person, where a person's phone would be? Somewhat. Usually triangulation is based off of the measurement from particular towers. And then whenever you have multiple, the more that you have, the more you can overlap those measurements away from a particular tower. When we're talking about the drive test, what we're looking at is the true coverage area of a tower and sector compared with the true coverage area of a second tower and sector. And what that gives us is that overlap, which can be, a, as you can see from some of the maps, that shape is not exactly circular or representative of, you know, defining lines. It can look more like a cloud than anything else. Okay. But based on the evidence that you've seen, based on the data that you've crunched, uh, you couldn't place anybody at the Daybell residence based on the cell data alone. There was no... There was no triangulation. You didn't use two towers in any of these, any of the charts that I saw. Is that right? So I did use multiple towers in some of them. And what I would say is that I wouldn't be able to definitively say that that phone was only at the Daybell residence. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about September 23rd. Uh, I believe you indicated uh, that Chad Daybell's phone and Alex Cox's phone were both at the same area of Chad Daybell's home. Is that right? So when we're looking at just the phone separate from the Google location history, what you could see is that Alex Cox's phone, the number ending 9120, was utilizing a Verizon tower. And then the number, and I'm going to mess up the last four, but the, starting with 515 for Chad Daybell's number, that's utilizing the AT&T network. So it's utilizing two different networks and then looking at the coverage area of the towers being utilized by the Daybell phone utilizing the AT&T network versus the Verizon phone utilizing the Verizon network. But you couldn't put them on the same property at the same time based on that data. I can't put them in the exact same location. I can only put them within the coverage area of those towers and sectors. Okay. And then again, those coverage areas are miles and miles apart, right? Yes, correct. Okay, all right. And how long uh, were Alex Cox and Chad Daybell within the coverage area together on so September 23rd? I would have to look back at the slides to see the exact times, but again, it's dependent on whenever we see those records. So as an example, if you're looking at a time of 921, and there's a record at 921, then there's also a record at, say, 942. I can't say between that time any estimated location of where a phone is. I can only estimate the location at those given times in the records. Can you explain to the jury again, because I was a little confused about this as well, explain to the jury again why you can sometimes read text messages that were given uh, as you did in, in your CAST report and sometimes you, you just say that there's an SMS message or that there's a text message? Absolutely. So there's two ways that you can get to the con well, two general ways that you can get to the content of a text message. You could do it either by looking at the phone, and basically what we would do in law enforcement would be a forensic download of that phone to pull all the data off of there. So it's dependent on an examiner of what files are there, if something's deleted, whether it's recoverable. That's separate from what I'm doing. Typically what I'm doing is I'm looking at interactions between a particular carrier and a phone, not per se what's in the phone itself. So whenever I'm doing that, it's dependent on what records are maintained by each individual carrier. So at the time, whenever this investigation was going on and the dates that I was looking for, Verizon was the only carrier that maintains content of text messages for a window of anywhere between three and seven days. It just depends on their specific, um, how many text messages go across a specific account. So after that, they don't retain them. The other carriers don't retain text messages. So the only way that I would be able to review the content of text messages would be if there was a forensic download of the phone and those messages were recoverable, or we obtained records from a Verizon phone within that short window of time. And I believe, I believe you indicated you did find 
some content on Chad Daybell's phone. Is that right? Yes, that was on one of the Verizon phones. Okay. And you got that content within three to seven days of uh, of it being made, of the text so being made? That search warrant would have been not been done by me. Um, typically, an investigator will serve a search warrant, obtain data from a cell phone provider, and then send that message, send that data to us to conduct analysis on. So I couldn't speak to when that search warrant was done. Okay. So you indicated a lot of uh, GPS location on Alex Cox. You didn't have any GPS locations on Lori Vallow or Chad Daybell, is that right? I did not, no. Okay. You didn't use that in any of your analysis? I didn't have it to use. Okay. Uh, were you aware of how long Lori and Alex had lived in this particular area of Rexford? Roughly. Um, I know they were somewhat new to the area, but as far as dates, no, I'm not aware. If I were to tell you that they had moved there September the 1st of that same year, it's 2019, uh, and these all these records look like they're from uh, September the 1st through October, November, December of 2019. Does that make sense? So I know I had records prior to September the 1st, but I don't recall mapping those out to see like when those devices first started showing up in Rexburg. Okay. So given the fact that they had moved there, if you wouldn't mind uh, uh, just assuming that they had moved there on September the 1st, there's no way that you could make any type of assumptions uh, based on patterns of, of behavior um, f for where these people were going or what they were doing, right? Suggestion, speculation? Overruled. <clears throat> I mean, what I was going to say is that typically when I speak on other cases, the more data we have, so for instance, if I'm looking for an individual that's wanted by law enforcement, typically what I would do is I would look at 30 days historically to try and get a pattern of what that phone's doing during those 30 days. And so, I mean, I would agree to you from this from the standpoint of the more records I have to establish what's called a pattern of life would be better. But you've indicated that in other uh, cases you have established a pattern of life based on a 30-day time frame period? A version of pattern of life. Again, it's dependent on the records because I think, like, everybody in this courtroom has, you know, a routine or something that they typically do. And if we were to examine records for the past 30 days versus for the past year, you would either see – major changes or you might see the same thing. It just depends on everybody's particular situation. Okay. Um, on October the 19th, the date that uh, Tammy Daybell passed away, or the 18th, um, you, you believe that Lori's phone was in Hawaii, is that right? So from the record that I showed um, at that particular time, that device was in Hawaii. And then I would add to that too that, you know, it's not right around the corner, so it would take, you know, travel to get to Hawaii. Right. All right. Thank you. I have no further questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Any redirect from the state? Just one moment, Your Honor. Uh, Defense counsel asked you about GPS location data for Lori Daybell and Chad. Lori Vallow or Lori Daybell and Chad Daybell, correct? Yes, correct. Uh, is it possible to turn the GPS geolocation data off on your phone? It is. So as I mentioned before, um, especially with Google, that location services is based off of whether a user wants to opt in or out. And so as part of their privacy protections, you can opt out of your location being maintained by Google. That's all I have. Very well. That will conclude the testimony of this witness then. Uh, is this witness going to be recalled or can he be excused from any subpoena?
Your Honor, at this time, we wouldn't excuse him from a subpoena. Would not? No, thank you. All right. Agent Balance, then you are still under subpoena, subject to the direction of the state. If you, if there's a potential you'll be recalled, I'll instruct you that I'll ask you again whether or not you've viewed any of the trial testimony. So if you're intending to testify again, you're not allowed to view that based on the exclusionary rule that's been ordered in this case. So with that in mind, then, you can go ahead and be excused. The bailiff will help assist you out of court, and the state could call its next witness. Your Honor, Spencer Rammel for the state. Can we have a quick sidebar before we call this next witness, please? Yes. Thank you. All right, Mr. Rammel, then you can call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The state would call Summer Shifflett. Thank you. If you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. All right, before we get started, then, I'll note that the court has previously designated this particular witness as a representative under Idaho's victims' laws, so the exclusionary rule would not apply as to this witness, whether or not she's watched any trial testimony. So I'll just advise you, then, Ms. Shifflett, when you're being questioned, please use verbal responses so we get your answers on the record. Please avoid talking at the same time as anyone asking you a question. Wait for their question to be complete. That way we'll also keep the record clear, and with those ground rules in mind, then, Mr. Rammel, you can go ahead and inquire on your direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Ms. Shifflett. Good morning. Can I please have you state your full name and spell your last name for the record? Summer Shifflett, S-H-I-F-L-E-T. Ms. Shifflett, how do you know the defendant in this case? She's my sister. I'm sorry, Lori Vallow-Dabo. You're fine. She's my sister. And is she your older sister? Yes. And this is obvious without asking, Ms. Shifflett, but can I have you clarify for the record how that makes you related to J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan? Tylee and J.J. were my niece and nephew. And did you... I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ms. Shifflett. If you don't mind, if you can kind of lean forward right to the microphone and talk into it, we'll make sure to pick up the recording. Okay. Thank you. And did you play an active role in your niece and nephew's life? Yes. When were you first made aware that your niece and nephew were missing? I think through the media, but probably December of 2019. And at that time, December of 2019, were you in contact with your sister? No. Were you aware of where she was located at that time? No. Ms. Shifflett, have you had a close relationship with your sister? Yes. At some point, did you talk to your sister and ask her about J.J. and Tylee's well-being? Yes. I think our first contact was in February of 2019, after she had been arrested. And what did she tell you about J.J. and Tylee? I don't remember the exact wording, but she basically 
told me that she was aware of where they were and that they were safe. Ms. Shifflett, fair to say that you trusted what she told you? Yes. You believed your sister when she stated to you that JJ and Tylee were safe? Yes. I'm gonna draw your attention to early June of 2020 uh, when JJ and Tylee's bodies were found. You testified that you trusted your sister. After the discovery of JJ and Tylee, did that change? Yes. Why? I felt lied to and my trust in my sister was broken. Ms. Shifflett, a recording of a video visit between yourself and Ms. Vallow Daybell has previously been admitted in this case. Do you recall the date of that specific video call? I believe it was on June 24th. I had received a request for me to call her. And just for clarification of the record, do you recall the year? 20, 2020. Your Honor, can I be handed what has previously been admitted as State's Exhibit 34A? Yes. And Your Honor, having been previously admitted, I now ask to publish what has been previously admitted and marked as State's Exhibit 34A to the jury. All right, give me just a moment to confer with the clerks, please. All right, permission to publish is granted, Mr. Rammel. Thank you, Judge.
Your Honor, that's all I have for this witness. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Rammel. All right. Exhibit 34A has been returned to the court clerk. Is there a cross-examination? Mr. Archibald. I'm sorry you had to relive that. Thank you. So just some foundation to give some background here. You're Lori's younger sister, you said? Yes. And you're one of how many children? I'm the youngest of five. And who's the oldest child? Stacy, my oldest sister. And is she alive or is she deceased? She's deceased. And did she have any children before she died? Yes. And who would that be? My niece, Melanie. Okay. Is that who we've heard the name Melanie Bedreau or Melanie Pulaski? Is that Stacy's child? Yes. Okay. And then who's next after Stacy? Alex. And then Alex Cox is who we've heard that name during this trial as well. How much older is he than you? I think eight years. Okay. And then who's next after Alex? Adam. And Adam Cox, where does he live now? St. George, Utah. Okay. And then, and he was a friend of Charles Vallow? Yes. Okay. And then who's next after Adam? Well, my parents had a child that died. Her name was Laura Lee. We called her Lolly. But she died before I was born. Okay. How old was she when she died? Six weeks. Okay. And then after her, who was next? Lori. And so Lori is how much older than you? Two years. And so you and Lori grew up together? Yes. And you grew up together where? In Rialto, California. And how old were you when you moved away from California? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. How old were you, or how long did you live in California? I think until I was about 18, 17 or 18. Okay. So you and Lori would have been adults by the time that you moved away from California? Yes. So would you describe, how would you describe your relationship with Lori growing up? I feel like we had a close relationship. We had a lot of similar interests and friends in common, and we did a lot of activities together. Okay. Go to schools together? Yes. Go to church together? Yes. How would you describe your family life? I think we had a good family. I mean, we had problems, but we also had a lot of fun. And do you remember when Lori, her first marriage? Yes. Do you remember how old she was? It was right out of high school, so I think 18. So she was 18, and you were 16 when that happened? Yeah. And did that marriage last long? No. Do you remember her second marriage? Yes. And who was that to? William LaGioia. And is that the father of Colby, who we met here last week? Yes. Okay. And did that marriage last long? Longer than the first, but not that long. Okay. And then did Lori get married again? Yes. And who was her third husband? Joseph Ryan. And is Joseph Ryan the father of Tylee Ryan? Yes. And during this time of these relationships that Lori was having, did you stay close with Lori? Off and on. 
When, when did you get married? In 2000. And, and so did you have your own uh, life that you were trying to live as well? Yes. And did you um, try to maintain good contact with Lori? Yes, but we lived in two different states, so it was more challenging. Okay. And you have children of your own? Yes. And how many children do you have? Three. Okay. And uh, do you recall when Lori separated from Joe Ryan? Yes. And uh, and did Lori protect Colby and Tylee from Joe Ryan? Yes. All right. And so uh, when you talk on this uh, on this phone call with your sister Lori, um, that you would have never done anything to harm your children. Is that the way you felt? Yes. Yeah. And that's because of seeing her raise Colby and Tylee and JJ. Yes. Did you also get to know uh, Charles Vallow? Yes. And uh, how did, if you can briefly tell us about the relationship between Charles and Lori? I think they had a great relationship in the beginning and they seemed very compatible and they seemed very happy and they adopted JJ? Yes. And were you involved in your sister's life when that happened? Yes. Were you involved in your sister's life when Lori and Charles separated? Yes. Uh, were you aware that Charles had filed for divorce? I'm not sure if I knew that until it came out in the media. Because I don't think she was ever served. Okay. And then they, so they, as far as you knew, they had reconciled. Yes. Okay. So uh, were you a part of Lori's life uh, when Charles and JJ uh, moved to Texas? Yes. Not as close, but yes. Okay. Were you a, a part of Lori's life when the whole family had moved to Hawaii? Yes. Now, was Hawaii a destination that, that your family had gone to as well when you were a child? Um, I had been there one time as a child, and then I didn't go back again until I was a married adult. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I did go back one time before I got married, so I had two trips before I got married. Okay. And so uh, was that a place that your father and mother had taken you uh, and the family? <laughs> Yes. All right. uh, how uh, did you uh, see Tylee grow up? Yes. Uh, how would you describe Tylee? I would describe her as beautiful and witty and very talented in a lot of different ways. Uh, did she... Uh, have health issues in her life? Yes. Uh, do you remember what those were? She had pancreatitis several times. And, and do you know what that is? It's a swelling of your pancreas. Okay. It, was that something that required hospitalization? Yes. Okay. And were you able to see Tylee and Lori together? Yes. And can you describe that? I think Lori was a loving mother, and Tylee adored her mother. They had a, they fought sometimes. Tylee had a little sassy streak in her, but um, I always felt like Lori was very patient with her. Were you ever concerned about the safety of Tylee around Lori? No. Uh, would you ever imagine your sister uh, wanting to kill her kids? No. Would you ever imagine your sister being involved in conspiring to kill her kids? No. <laughs> now, uh, 
the way you were raised, were you raised in, in a way to believe in Jesus? Yes. And, and the Jesus that you were taught about, was that a, a Jesus who was kind and loving? Yes. And is that how you were taught? Yes. And is that how uh, Lori was taught? Yes. And is that how Lori taught her children? Yes. So um, did you ever hear uh, your sister talk about multiple lives? She's, she, she and Alex had both mentioned that to me, I think, in late 2018. Okay. The first was, that, time. was that something new? Yes. Was that something that you had been taught as children? No. Uh, did you ask Lori where this new belief was coming from? I don't know if I asked her that directly. Uh, did she talk about multiple creations? Yes. Uh, being reincarnated as different people over the eons of time. Is that what she was telling you? Not with the word reincarnated, but yes. Okay. That, so they weren't using the word reincarnated, but multiple probations, multiple creations. Correct. And is that something new that you had heard? It was new to me. Uh, had you ever heard, Lori, be talk about being someone in another life prior to late 2018? No. At, at this time in late 2018 or early 2019, did she tell you that she had been someone else in another life? Prior to 2018? Prior to 2018. No. In late 2018 or 2019, did she tell you that? Yes. That she, did she tell you about her previous lives? Yes. Did any of that make sense to you? Not really. Uh, did you believe it? I tried to. I wanted to believe her, but it didn't make sense. Did she tell you in late 2018, 2019 about zombies? And Your Honor, at this point I'm going to object to hearsay. Uh, Ms. Valaday Bell is not a party opponent as to the defense. The exception does not apply. Let me think about that for just a minute. Mr. Rammel, can you further explain why you think the exception would not apply here and why this would be hearsay? Uh, Judge, I think the exception, uh, he's asking specifically for statements of uh, his client. Uh, she is a party opponent of the state. Uh, the party opponent uh, from the state's perspective, wouldn't apply uh, to Ms. Vallow, who is uh, the client of Mr. Uh, Archibald. All right, what's your response to that, Mr. Archibald? Your Honor, Your Honor this is just some foundation. I think the jury's already heard bits and pieces of this. This is just to confirm that information. Uh, it's been admitted in the state's case in chief, and I do find that it's relevant and would not uh, be hearsay. So I'll overrule the objection and allow the witness to answer that last question, which was, uh, and I'll just cite, did she tell you in late 2018, 2019 about zombies was the question. So you can answer. I don't recall her ever telling me about zombies, that word. I don't remember her ever using that terminology. Okay. Uh, did she talk to you about her ability to cast out evil spirits? I believe so. Uh, did she tell you about light and dark scales? Yes. And is that something that you had heard before that time period? Never. Uh, did she tell you that she was a goddess? I don't recall if she used that terminology. Did she tell you that she was a leader of the 144,000? No. Did she tell you that there was a new church called the Church of the Firstborn? I don't recall her ever telling me that specifically. Yeah. 
were you concerned about your your sister with her new beliefs? I don't know that I was concerned about safety of anybody. I just was concerned. I mean, I, of course, I care about my sister, but I didn't really know what to think about it. Okay. So I don't know if concerned is the right word. Okay, but fair enough. Uh, how was your relationship with with Alex? Um, I was close with Alex. Now, uh, can you tell the jury what he was like? Well, he was my big brother, and sometimes he was hilarious and fun, and sometimes he was um, kind of crude or obnoxious in a way. And But most of the time, we got along really well, and he was at my house most weekends playing games with my kids. And, and did he have children of his own? No. Uh, did he... Uh, suffer a brain injury as a teenager? Yes. And what, what, was that from a car accident? Yes. And did that uh, brain injury in that car accident, did that affect him? I was, believe it did. Uh, was he different uh, after that car accident than he was before? He seemed almost stuck in making like teenage decisions. He got in his car accident at 16 and he kind of made decisions like a 16 year old most of his life. So he was, uh, it, that's what you observed is that he was stuck as a teenager. In his decision making, yes. Okay. Uh, are, do you stay in touch with Colby Ryan? Yes. And uh, Colby had previously stated my mom spent her whole life protecting us kids. Would, would you agree with that? Yes. Colby also stated after she met Chad Daybell, she changed. Would you agree with that? Yes. Thank you for your testimony. All right. Thank you, Mr. Archibald. So to clarify there, counsel had requested of the court prior that the defense was going to call Ms. Shiflett as their own witness, so the court permitted uh, the defense to go beyond cross and have a direct examination essentially there. So with that then, Mr. Rammel, if you'd like to conduct cross and or redirect, you can do so. Thank you, Judge, just very quickly. Ms. Shifflett, just a, a couple questions for you. I'm going to draw your attention back to the time period in which uh, you were made aware uh, that JJ and Tylee were missing. You testified that your sister told you that she knew where Tylee was? I don't remember if she used that wording, but yes, that was what was relayed to me. Okay, and conveyed to you that she knew uh, where JJ was? Yes. She told you uh, that they were safe? Yes. Ms. Shifflett, she lied to you about them being safe? I believe so, yes. Judge, that's all I have. All right. That will conclude then the testimony of Ms. Shiflett. Is she allowed to be excused from any subpoena she's under at this time? Your Honor, that would be the state's request. All right. Does the uh, defense have any reason to uh, not have her released from the subpoena? No, Your Honor. No objection. All right. Thank you, Mr. Archibald. Ms. Shiflett, then you can go ahead and be escorted out of the courtroom by the bailiff. Thank you for your testimony. <laughs> Your Honor, uh, you just asked that she be escorted out of the courtroom. I believe she's allowed to stay with. Oh, I appreciate if the If she so wishes. Yes, she is. And an excused uh, witness can also maintain. I just was having her taken back so she's able to remain. And then the state, you can call your next witness at this time.
The state will call Rick Schmidt, Your Honor, and I will be handling the witness. All right, Ms. Smith. All right, before we get started then, now that the witness has been sworn, let me just inquire, have you observed in any way any of the trial testimony in this case before taking the stand today? No. All right, thank you. I'll ask you to please make verbal responses to any questions that are asked so we can keep a clear record and please avoid speaking at the same time as anyone that's questioning you so the record stays clear also and sort of lean forward and talk right into that microphone so we make sure to pick up the recording of your voice with those ground rules in mind. Then, Ms. Smith, if you'd like to inquire on direct, you may. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Hi. Could you please state your name and introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury and spell your last name, please? My name is Richard Arthur Schmidt, Jr. The spelling of my last name is S-C-H-M-I-T-T, and I go by Rick. Sir, how are you employed right now? Currently, I'm employed with the Brigham Young University of Idaho's Public Safety Department. How long have you been employed at BYU-Idaho? Just over two years. And where did you work before that? The Rexburg Police Department. How long did you work at the Rexburg Police Department? Twenty-one years. Did, in that, your employment at the Rexburg Police Department, did you become involved in the investigation into the, what started out as a missing child case and ended up a homicide investigation involving J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan? Yes. Okay. For context, what was your first involvement in the investigation? My first involvement was on November the 4th. I came to work and found out that detectives and other officers were at, in the parking lot, surveying a gray Jeep Wrangler with Texas plates in the parking lot of the Stonebrook Apartments in Rexburg off of Pioneer Road. Okay. Did you participate in that surveillance detail? I went over there to see if they needed any help. I wasn't assigned to anything, but I stayed in the area to see if they needed any help at some point in time. Okay. What was your next contact with the investigation? My next contact was on December the 17th of 2019. I was assigned to go with some other detectives from the Rexburg Police Department, the Fremont County Sheriff's Office, and the FBI to Springville, Utah, to interview family members of Chad Daybell and Tammy Baybell. Okay. Why were you going over there to interview those family members? We were trying to locate information on the missing children, J.J. and Tylee. And at some point, did the investigation change or expand? It did. Okay. And did you have involvement in seeking any warrants? I did. What warrants did you work on seeking search warrants? What warrants did you prepare and seek? The first one was a Venmo account warrant for Tylee and Lori's Venmo accounts. Okay. Why were you looking at Tylee and Lori's Venmo accounts? We'd received a tip 
that there was some activity on Tylee's Venmo account? Um, of what nature? Uh, there were some different punctuation, different grammar, and different emojis that appeared there that were different from past transactions. Okay. So there appeared to be a change in um, sort of language style um, in the communications in Tylee's Venmo? Yes. And were you able to get that? I did. Okay. And those have previously been in, um, admitted, Your Honor. Um, but... Um, did you also participate in the obtaining of any other evidence? I did. What did you ab seek to obtain? On the 8th of January of 2020, I received a, a video footage from uh, Joe Powell from Fremont County Sheriff's Office that had some footage of West Yellowstone National Parks from the west entrance of that park. Okay. Um, did you review that video footage? I did. The video that I had was from September the 8th of 2019. I viewed that video and I was looking for a blue Nissan Rogue, a silver Ford pickup, and or a gray Jeep Wrangler. Okay. And I, did you see any of those vehicles in that video? I did. I, I saw one that looked like the the uh, Ford pickup, silver Ford pickup. Okay. Um, and were you able to see anything else about that vid video? Uh, on that one, I could not see. It didn't have a very good angle of the video. So I requested from Jacob Olson more video from that date. Okay. And did you get more? And I apologize. Who is Jacob Olson? He is. He works for Yellowstone National Park Service. Okay. And did Mr. Olson with the Park Service give you more video? He did. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, did you look at that video? I did. What did you see? Uh, the angle that I, the, one of the camera views that I was viewing was from the B lane of the west gate of Yellowstone National Park. I could see a silver Ford pickup with Arizona license plate, CP Quint, and the driver of that vehicle was Alex Cox. Okay. And I, I think you said, but I apologize, I may have missed it. Was this on September 8th of 2019, the this video? video? Yes, this video was from September 8th, okay. 2019. And in that video, you were able to see license plates of what? Of the Ford, silver Ford pickup, Arizona plate, CP Quint. And um, did you see any, make any observa other observations about that video? Yes, you could see that there was a passenger in the front passenger seat of that vehicle that looked to be a a female, but I could not identify who that was. Okay. Were you able to see any of the interactions with Park Service employees or anyone? Yes, as Alex was pulling away from the, the ticket booth gate, um, he looked over his right shoulder into the back seat and you could see the park service lady at the gate um, she looked towards the back seat and then waved at someone appeared to be someone in the back seat like they would like she would wave to a little kid did was there anything else of note that you can think of in that video no okay um did you take any additional steps to collect evidence um in this investigation? Yes. What did you do that you can remember next? Uh, the next, I got a warrant on the, first of all, on the 14th of January of 2020. Let me ask you this. Did you search in the area or any local businesses or any establishments? Yes. Okay. 
Okay. What establishments did you search? Um, so on on the second of February two thousand twenty, I went and searched. I went with Detective Consitus to Self Storage Plus at four thirty three Airport Road. Why and did you guys go to the Self Storage Plus? Um, and I'm assuming that's in Rexburg? Yes, Rexburg, Idaho. Why did you go to the Self Storage Plus in Rexburg, Idaho in the beginning of February of 2020? So the owner, DJ Barney, had released some video of his storage units to East Idaho News, and we were there seeking that same video. Okay. And um, were you able to obtain that video? Yes. Okay. Um, were you able to review that video? I was. Prior to reviewing that video, did you meet with anyone to help you recognize people? Uh, yes. During our investigation, we we saw pictures of um, Chad, Lori, and Alex. Okay. So um, in recognizing those faces, were you able to make any observations about the video you received from the Self Storage Plus? Yes. Okay. Um, generally, what observations did you make? Uh, all three of them were there at some point in time uh, in that video. There were many days that they were in and out of the storage unit. They would take stuff to the storage unit. They would pick stuff up from the storage unit. All right. So there were numerous days, but I, I want to ask you about a couple in particular did you um, see whether or not um, the, um, any of them went into the storage room at, around the beginning of October? Yes. Um, who do you recall going uh, in, seeing going in and out of that storage unit around, let's say, October 1st? October 1st was Lori. She had came in her, I'm assuming it was her blue Nissan Rogue, Rogue. Uh, she was seen going to the storage unit and putting a box and a tote in that storage unit. Okay. Um, did you see her or anyone, either of those three, sort of the next day or within a couple of days? Yes. Okay. Um, when did when do you recall seeing her next? Uh, there was one on the on the second of October too, but I'd have to look at my notes to see what who was there and, and what they would have okay. brought into the and, and did storage you bring, unit. No problem. Would, did you bring your... The storage unit. Okay. Um, did you bring your notes or your reports with, with you? I did. And would reviewing your notes or report aid you in refreshing your recollection, allowing you to answer that last question? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, I'd ask um, they be shown initially to defense counsel and then to the witness, please. Very well. I can't at a break. I don't have them okay. right up on this list. I'm happy to. Um, those were his documents. I didn't prepare them. All right. Can you just reiterate, Ms. Smith, what has been handed to the witness at this point? Um, the witness had brought in a file of his own with his own reports and items in there. He had brought them in and handed them to me in case he needed to refresh his recollection. I believe it's probably copies of his reports and or whatever documents he needs to refresh his recollection. All right. Well, you can continue with your examination this time, and we'll see if uh, he needs to do that then. All right. Thank you. Did looking at those documents aid you in refreshing your recollection? 
Yes. Okay. Um, if you want to just col- close the folder, and then if you need it again, tell Thanks. us. We'll ask the judge um, uh, so that you can refresh your recollection as needed. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. He's closed the file, Your Honor. Or do you want him to take? You want me to take it back? No, or? no. I just wanted to make sure it looked like there was still another piece of notes on top of the okay. file. I was just making sure it was closed. So, yeah. just to instruct the witness, you're uh, only allowed to testify from your memory, and if you are ever referring to any specific notes, if that's allowed, we need to uh, make sure we're clear on the record that you have done that at that time. So, with that in mind, the file's closed, and you can continue questioning Ms. Smith. Thank you. I believe you had said you thought you saw another um, um, occurrence on October 2nd of 2019 where you saw um, one of the three individuals go into the storage unit in Rexburg? Yes. Okay. Um, can you tell us what you remember about that? On the 2nd of October, I saw Lori and Chad um, in the blue Nissan Rogue. And they got a spare tire and a seat out of the Nissan Rogue and put it in the storage unit. Okay. Now, um, when you saw uh, Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell put a spare tire in a car seat, um, was it like a baby car seat or what to- sort of seat was it? No, it was a, a big seat. It looked like it was a rear seat out of the Jeep Wrangler from before. Okay. And so um, when you saw them uh, in that video, was Alex Cox anywhere around on October 2nd? Uh, no, not in that video. Okay. Um, and then um, did you make any observations uh, on the video? Was there anything on the video the next day? Yes. Um, what was on the video recording for October 3rd of 2019? I'd have to refer to my notes to ref- refresh my memory. May he do so, Judge? Uh, is there any objection? No, he can refer to them as many times as he needs. Okay. You can refer to the notes. Again, just don't read from the notes. Um, so go ahead and take a look at those if you'd like. Sometime shortly here, Ms. Smith will want to take our lunch break. Okay. Did you have a chance to look at that? Yes. Does that refresh your recollection on October 3rd? Yes. Okay. What did you see on October 3rd? On October 3rd, I saw that Lori and Alex was there in the blue Nissan Rogue, and they took the spare tire and the seat from the car out of the storage unit and put it back in the Nissan Rogue. Your Honor, I have a few more dates. Do you, do you want to take a break now, or do you want me to keep going? Yeah, let's go ahead and take our okay. noon recess at this time, and then you can continue after that. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. All right, we will take our uh, lunch break at this time, then. We'll try to get started again sometime a little before 1 o'clock, and be in recess until then. All right, please. Thank you. Please be seated. We're ready to have the jurors brought in, I believe.
Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. <laughs> All right, we're back on the record on case CR 22211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. Uh, Ms. Smith was conducting direct examination of Officer Schmidt, and you can continue to do so at this time, Ms. Smith. <clears throat> Thank you, Honor. Good afternoon. All right. Now, um, you had talked to us about observations on the self-storage unit video um, from 2019, and, and you had just talked to us about the October 3rd, uh, uh, the observations you made on the video for October 3rd, 2019. Do you remember yes. talking about that? Yes. Okay. Um, so... Um, you had said earlier in direct that you, they were you saw those three individuals in and out of that storage unit on multiple additional dates, correct? Yes. All right. Um, let me ask you about <clears throat> um, any other dates you remember in October. Um, let's just talk about the end of October. Um, did you see whether or not any of those individuals went into the um, storage unit on or around um, October 16th. Yes. Okay. What did you see on that day? I'd have to look at my notes to refresh my memory. That's no problem. May he, Your Honor? Yes. Thanks. I believe defense indicated they didn't have any ongoing objection to that. What do you remember on the October 16th, 2008? Uh, Alex, Alex came into the, the area in his silver Ford pickup. Uh, he took a couple boxes and a couple totes out of the back of his pickup and put them in the storage unit, and also a couple gun scabbards out of his pickup and put them in the storage unit. Just so we're all clear, what when you say gun sta scabbard, what do you mean? It's a, a case that holds a rifle, firearms. So it's a pretty long case with a distinctive shape? Yes. If, if for individuals familiar with firearms, you easily recognizable? Yes. Okay. Um, and did you ever see Alex back at that storage unit on the video you observed? Yes. Okay. Um, oh, do you remember when? Uh, I think... On the 22nd of October. Okay. And um, what did you see Alex observe on that video Alex Cox do? I'll have to look at my notes to refresh my memory. Sure. Okay. What did you what do you remember seeing on October twenty second of two thousand nineteen? He took a gun scabbard out of the storage unit and put it in his pickup. And he also took a tote out of the storage unit and put it in his pickup. Okay. And then moving forward to the end of the month, did you make any observations about um, anyone on the videos on October twenty eighth, two thousand nineteen? Yes. Um, if you recall, what observations did you make on the video recording of November of October 28th? I'll have to look at my notes to refresh my memory. Okay.
Okay. What did you observe about so, the recording on the 28th? Alex took four gun scabbards out of the storage unit, put them in his pickup, and some totes and boxes and put them in his pickup. Okay. Was Alex alone that day or was anyone with him? I'd have to look at my notes again and refresh that. Sure, please. Okay. Chad was there with Alex. Okay. Did they take anything other than the uh, gun scabbards and the totes? Did they take anything else out? Uh, I don't believe so on that date. Okay. Um, and, like, um, there were several other days as well on that yes. video. Yes. Um, in which, if I could just finish, let me, like, um, there were there several other days in October and November of 2019 where you saw either Alex or Chad or Lori or a combination on those videos? Yes. Okay. Now, um, moving forward, did you also contact any other local businesses um, about information on this case? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, uh, what, who did you contact? On the 21st of January, I contacted the Unified Sportsman's Club uh, range, firearm shooting range. Okay. And um, why would you reach out to uh, shooting ranges? During our investigation, uh, Alex was a suspect in an attempted shooting of Tammy Daybell at her residence in Fremont County and also a shooting out of Gilbert, Arizona. Okay. Um, and so why did you go to the shooting ranges? To see if Alex had shot at that range. Okay. Um, and uh, when you say you went to the Unified Sportsman's Club, is that in uh, also known as the Fremont County Sportsman's Club? No. Okay. Um, did you obtain um, the records from the Sportsman's Club? I did. Okay. And um, when you obtained those records, did they give you copies of any pages? Yes. Okay. And those were pages you requested? Yes. Okay. I'd ask that I hand the witness State's Exhibit 297, which is a, a certified business record. The defense is, was put on notice, and I believe there's a stipulation for the admission of these business records. Um, for the admission of these, a courtesy copy of which has been given both the defense and the court. All right, Exhibit 297 has been offered. I'll let the defense have an opportunity to review that before questioning if it's objected to. No objection, Judge. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Exhibit 297 is admitted. Thank you, Judge. Sir, if you'd take a look at the pages attached to the affidavit. Um, are those copies from the Sportsman's Club that you mentioned receiving? Yes. Okay. Um, and did you ask for those copies or copies of those pages? Yes. All right. Now, um, and did you receive copies of those pages? Yes. Why did you ask for those? So we could have a copy of them. Okay. Why did you want a copy of those particular pages? Because they had different sign-in times that Alex had signed in on their log. Okay. Um, I request permission. Rather than have him tell us, I'll, I was going to ask permission to show the pages and have him walk us through it. Is that okay, Judge? They've been admitted, so they can be published. Thank you, Judge. Got what you need? Yep. All right. Let me hand you the first page of State's Exhibit 297 with the sign-in sheets. Let me show you. Can you read that? Yes. Okay. Um, now, you say you asked for specific pages that showed us where um, Alex had signed in. Did he always sign in under the name Alex Cox? No. 
What names did he use when you looked at the original records? What names of Alex, either Alex's name or that he associated with, did he use? I'm going to object to foundation, Judge. He hasn't explained how he knows that this, that if Alex did use an alias, that how he knows that it's an alias. It's sustained. Okay. Did you see names in the documents that were of interest to you in your investigation? Yes. What were those names? Alex Cox, Alex, and C. Quint. Okay. Now, why was C. Quint interesting to you? Alex's license plate on his vehicle was C. P. Quint. Okay. And so did you see the name C. Quint in the records? Yes. Did you at time on some of the pages also see any names Alex Cox? Yes. Okay. Now, let's start with this first page. The date of this at the top of the page for the record is called Fremont County Sportsman Club, and the first date and the first line is 10-6. Do you see it in that first column? Can you point it with the laser pointer to the jury? Do you see that date? Yes. Okay. Could you use your laser pointer and point at the big screen just so we're all in the same place? Oh, I was pointing on the other screen. Okay. There you go. All right. Now, what name of interest is reflected, if any, on this page? The one on the seventh. Okay. Can you point that on the big screen for us? What name is that? C. Quint. The same as, similar name as what was on Alex Cox's license plate? Yes. And that was what date? The 7th of October. Okay. Approximately what time? At 1220. Okay. Were there any other instances on this sheet that you recognized? I do not see one. Okay. Let me hand, let me put up what is the second page of the Fremont County Sportsman Club pages you obtained. Can you, what's the first date that you can read on that page? Looks like the 7th of October. Okay. Do you see any names of interest on that page? Yes. What's the name? C. Quint. Okay. What's the date? October the 8th, 2019. At what time? At 11 o'clock. Okay. Can you show us what you're referring to? Thank you. Okay. Were there any other names of interest on that page? I don't believe so. And turning to the third page of the documents labeled Fremont County Sportsman Club, can you read the first date available? I can't read what it is. What about the second line? The second line looks like October the 10th. So on the page starting with October 10th, do you see any names of interest on that page that was seized? If you lift the paper up just a little bit. Yeah. There we go. Sorry. Yes. What was the name? C. Quint. Okay. And what was the date? 10-12. What time? At 3 o'clock. And what about the fourth page of the Fremont County Sportsman? Can you read the date on that one? Yes. What's that date? October the 12th. Do you see any names on that page that you recognize? Yes. What's the name? C. Quint. Okay. Where is that? On the 13th at 1 o'clock. And the last page, what's that date? The October the 18th. Okay. And did you see any names you recognized in that instance? Yes. What name did you recognize? C. Quint. And can you show us where you're talking about? Right there on October the 15th at 8 o'clock. Okay. Now, 
thought I heard, and I may have misunderstood, that you said there was also an instance you believed he had signed in in another name? Yes. What name did he use in that instance? Alex Cox. Do you remember the date of that? That was on the 3rd of September, 2019. Okay. And the records we were given don't have those dates? No. Okay. So after you obtained the sportsman's records and the other from the gun club, what happens at that gun club, just so that I'm clear? People go out and shoot their firearms, whether it be a rifle or a shotgun or a handgun. Kind of target practice? Yes, target practice. Did you also participate in getting any other warrants? Yes. What other warrants did you get? Search warrants did you get? I got one on the 15th of January for Lori's cares.com account. Okay. And what other search warrants were you able to obtain in addition to that? A warrant for Sugar City Post Office and Rexburg Post Office. Okay. And did the Postal Service comply and give you those documents? Yes. Okay. Were you present at the time the Chad Daybell property was searched on January, on June 9th of 2020? Yes. Okay. Were you given any specific responsibilities as a part of that search? I was. What were your responsibilities as part of that search? At first I was assigned to keep an eye on Chad. Okay. Why? Why did they want to keep an eye on Chad? In case he left the property, they wanted us to track him and make sure we had eyes, at least on him or his vehicle. Okay. All right. And so while you were watching Chad Daybell, did you make any observations? I did. What were those observations? At one point in time when the search dogs were on the scene, Chad had got out of his vehicle that was parked in the driveway in front of his house, and when they were searching the area of where J.J.'s remains were found, Chad was facing towards that direction. Okay. And then after you saw that, what happened? After that, I believe Ron Ball and Detective, Lieutenant Ron Ball and Detective Ray Hermosillo came over and talked with Chad. Okay. After they had a con... Ray Hermosillo. After the lieutenant and the detective spoke to Chad Daybell, what happened? At some point in time, Chad went back in his house and then came out with a backpack and got back in his vehicle. Okay. Where did he go? After a time, he sat there in his vehicle and then he drove across the street to his daughter Emma's house and went inside the house. And did you continue to watch where he was at that point? I did. Okay. What happened after that? After some time, Chad came out of Emma's house, got in his vehicle, and started going south on, I believe it was 1900 East in Fremont County. Okay. And did you and other officers follow him and eventually stop him? Yes, we did. Okay. After that, did you participate in any other search warrants? Yes. What search warrants did you participate in or did you obtain? One for Lori's DNA. Just Lori? Lori and Chad. Okay. And so when you say one for Lori and Chad, were those search warrants granted? Yes, they were. Okay. And did you go and collect the DNA or other samples? I did not collect the samples. Who did? I believe it was forensic, a forensics lab for the FBI. Okay. And was the also Idaho State Police lab involved? Yes. Okay. And did you also, as a part of that search warrant, ask for hair and fingerprint samples? Yes. Okay. And then did you participate in any other search warrants? No search warrants that I believe. Okay. Did you obtain any other search warrants? 
Not to my recollection. Okay. One moment, please, Your Honor. Yes. I'm going to circle back briefly to partici your participation at the scene on January, uh, I'm sorry, June 9th of 2020 at Dad, Chad Daybell's property. Okay. After um, Mr. Daybell was stopped and officers participated in that, was that the end of your day or did you have additional responsibilities? No, I had additional responsibilities. Okay. What were your additional responsibilities? <clears throat> I was with Officer Eric Wheeler from the police department and we transported Chad to Fremont County Jail, released him to them, and then came back to the scene. Okay. Um, did you have responsibilities at the scene? Yes. What were some of those responsibilities <clears throat> or assignments? I was assigned to help search the fire pit area okay. and the pet cemetery area. Okay. Um, and did you do that? Yes. While you were there, um, did you participate in um, locating any items or helping um, obtain any evidence? Yes. What, what items did you help with? Uh, I found teeth. I found burnt pieces of bone. I found found human flesh, burnt human flesh. Okay. And um, officers were each kind of taking turns at times, sifting through that stuff? Yes. Okay. So when officers would find something, what would they do with it? They would give it to the the evidence custodian that was there. Okay. And would it be put in a particular place? Yes. Where? Mm, that I'm not sure where they actually okay. put it. Did you see a tarp next to any of the locations? Yes. Okay. Um, did you also help locate any or remove any buckets or information like that? Yes. Okay. Can you tell us about that? Yes. As we were digging in the pet cemetery, we'd take turns there and dig through the dirt. Um, there was a time that that dirt was pretty hard. It looked like somebody had poured quickcrete or a fence post cement mix over top of it, so it was hard to, to get through that. We actually had to call a backhoe in and have them remove a portion of that. After that, we were able to dig through that. Um, and then we found um, some remains, uh, thought to be Tylee's. It was in a melted green Platts electric bucket. Okay. And um, did you see that bucket removed from the ground and put on that tarp? Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. I have nothing further. All right. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Who will conduct cross? Is that you, Mr. Thomas? I will, Judge. Very well. Good afternoon, Mr. Schmidt. Hi. Uh, you were involved with this case about three years ago, is that right? Yes, something like that. And then you started working for BYU in their law enforcement division, is that right? Uh, not law enforcement, but it's public safety. What's, I, I guess... It's I, security. Okay. So it's similar, just... Uh, we just don't have any police powers. Okay, all right. Um, and you started doing that, when did you start working for BYU? Um, it was in December of 2020. 2020? Yes. Okay. So you reviewed these uh, videos at this storage unit uh, place in Rexburg, uh, and you your report indicates that it was written on February the 6th, 2020. Is that right? Yes. And so this was while you were still working for Rexburg, or were you now working for BYU? I was working for Rexburg. Working for Rexburg. And then later on in the year, in December, he started working for? Yes. BYU. Okay. So uh, three years ago, working there, uh, you had to refresh your recollection quite a few times. Uh, is that because you hadn't reviewed 
the videos in about three years. Does that make sense? No, I reviewed some of the videos a month or so ago. A month or so ago? Yeah. Okay. How many videos did you review? Uh, all the all the number all the ones that are in my report. There's quite a number of them. So you reviewed all the videos that you collected? Yes. Okay. All right. When you went to the Sportsman's Club, did you actually go there and talk to somebody or did you just serve them a warrant? I went there and talked to them. And do you know who runs that? Uh, not who runs it. I know the secretary's name. Okay. It's Carrie Frisbee. Do you ever go out there yourself? No. Okay. So you don't, you're not familiar with what they do out there or how they, how they run things out there is what I'm saying. Right. Okay. Um, when people check in, did you ask, did you ask about how they check in and what, how that works? Yes. And what do they say? She said, it's just on your honor. If you show up, you check in, there's nobody there that monitors it. If you don't check in, you don't check in. Gotcha. So, and what about paying the fee? Who do you pay that to? There's a box that they put the money in. Okay. So, did you talk to some of the people that are on the list of people that were there on the days that you believe Alex Cox was there? No. Okay. Um, so you're just making an assumption that C. Quint is actually Alex Cox? Yes. You didn't do any follow-up? No. You didn't ask anybody about it? No. All right. You indicated that you had some duties on June the 9th uh, when they were sifting through Chad Daybell's backyard. Is that right? Yes. You said you found some teeth and you found some bones and some flesh. Yes. Do you recall specifically where you were when you found these items? Yes. Where were you? In the fire pit area and okay. the pet cemetery area. All right. Um when generally, and I'm not trying to say that anybody did anything wrong or didn't do it correctly or whatever, but isn't it best practices to use some sort of a grid type of an uh, outline? Is that is that best practices when you're trying to sift through something like this? I wouldn't know. You wouldn't know? No. Okay. Was there any type of boundaries that you were given? Uh, no boundaries that I was given. Just, hey, here's a shovel. Go out there and find some stuff. Yes. That's what it was? Pretty much. All right. To my recollection. Okay. No further questions. Any redirect from the state? No, Judge. All right. That will conclude the testimony of this witness then. Uh, can Officer Schmidt be released from any subpoena or will he be recalled? Yes, we can be released. Any objection to his release? No objection. Okay, thanks for your testimony. You can be excused. All right, state can call its next witness. State would call Steve Daniels.
All right, now that the uh, witness has been sworn, I'll just inquire briefly. Um, Mr. Daniels, did you previously review or view or listen to any of the trial testimony in this case? No. All right, thank you for your response. When you're being questioned, please make verbal responses and try to avoid talking at the same time as anyone questioning you so we can keep the record clear. With that in mind, then, Mr. Wood, you can inquire on direct. Thank you. Mr. Daniels, can you state your full name and spell your last name for the record? Steve Daniels, D-A-N-I-E-L-S. What is your occupation? I'm a special agent with the FBI. Okay. Uh, and how long have you worked for the FBI? Approximately 25 years. Uh, and are you, do you have a specific, um, specific job or duty in the FBI? I'm a special agent, and then an alternate duty is uh, I'm a senior team leader for the evidence response team. Okay. Um, is the evidence response team sometimes referred to as ERT? Yes. Okay. So if I say ERT, we're both tracking that that's evidence that, response that team. That means evidence response team, yes. Okay. And how long have you worked with the evidence response team? Um, I kind of have an off and on over those 25 years with ERT. Um, so I'll just say approximately 13 to 15 years. Okay. And have you, do you, do you or have you held any supervisory roles in the ERT? I'm currently the senior team leader for ERT and I've had that role for 10 years. Okay. Other than the FBI, have you had any other law enforcement experience? I have not. Okay. Uh, let's talk about ERT real quick. What uh, What is the primary role of ERT? So the evidence response team uh, kind of handles the forensics for the FBI. So we're kind of like a CSI team. Um, and our all of our ERT members go back to Quantico, Virginia, and we get like an 80-hour basic training in how to process crime scenes or execute search warrants. Okay. So there's an 80-hour basic training. Is there any other training you do? Besides the basic uh, training that we receive at Quantico, Virginia, uh, after that, all of our members are offered other advanced trainings, and there's many of those. Have you participated in any other advanced trainings? Uh, the one that's relevant for today would be uh, the Human Remain Recovery course, and that's offered at the University of Tennessee. Uh, tell me a little bit about that course. How long is it? I want, if I remember right, it's about a week long training, so about 40 hours, and that's just kind of where you would learn how to recover human remains from different scenes. Okay. Do, what involvement, if any, did you have with a search on the Chad Daybell residence on June 9th and 10th of 2020? The evidence response team was asked, initially asked by a local FBI case agent to help come up with a search strategy uh, to, we would be executing a search warrant on June 9th and 10th of 2020 at the Chad Daybell property. Um, and that included a residence, outbuildings, and a three to four acre property. And one of the things we'd be looking for is human remains along with other evidence of a crime. Okay. Uh, what did you and your team do in preparation for that search? I was first notified that there would be a search warrant um, approximately a week prior to the search warrant execution. And that, so from that, the preparation phase would have involved talking to the local case, FBI case agent and then talking to uh, local police, Rexburg PD, police department, um, talking to uh, the evidence response team unit, and they're the unit that oversees uh, all the evidence response teams nationwide. And then we would have also talked to the FBI laboratory at Quantico, Virginia, and we would have come up with all kind of a team effort, come up with a kind of a search strategy or game plan as to how we would process or execute uh, this, this search on the property uh, specifically, the, the difficult part would be looking for human remains. Where would we find them? And I can go into more of that if you want. That's, that's okay. We'll, we'll get there. Um, when did you arrive on the Daybell property? 
So on June 9th of 2020, uh, just in the early morning hours. Okay. And what was the first thing uh, you instructed your team to do? Since we did have a week of preparation, I had approximately eight ERT members with me. And so for my eight ERT members, everybody was pretty much tasked with a role uh, before we arrived. So some of the things that ERT members would have done, I would have had a photographer, uh, somebody that's going to take overall as-is photos of this property before law enforcement or ERT <coughs> has touched anything. We would have had somebody start a crime scene sign-in log so that we know who's coming and going from the scene. I, as the team leader, would have had a, a administrative worksheet or log. Um, and one of the things that I would have first done is done a preliminary survey. So I would have walked through the scene um, looking for areas of interest, things that we had already, some of those things we had already identified uh, during our week-long preparation. So we had some priority areas that we had uh, already noted. So were there specific areas on the property that you were uh, oriented towards? Yep, so we had, because we had a week-long um, preparation, we already had some aerial imagery, satellite imagery um, of this property. So we kind of knew some items that might be located on it. One of them was a fire pit. We could see that from satellite imagery. So we knew that that would be an area of interest to us. So we already had an idea that that's an area we had to process. So we had two ERT members already designated once we got there to go start assessing that fire pit. Um, we had some telephone information from suspects involved in the case um, that showed where they were on the property um, from back in September of 2019. So we kind of had an idea as to their locations on that property, and we called that telephone ping information. So we had some general ideas as to where those persons were on the property, and we kind of had that mapped out. So we had some ideas as to where we could look potentially on this three to four acre property. We had a text message just from based on the investigation that kind of talked about a pet cemetery. So we didn't know where the pet cemetery was on the three to four acres, but once we got there, that was part of our assessment or preliminary survey was to say, hey, can we identify where the pet cemetery is located? Because there was a text message that talked about burying something in the pet cemetery. So that was an area of interest we needed to find. And then one of the telephone pings showed an area around a pond, like a northeast part of this pond that we wanted to go at least look at. Okay. Uh, so those were some areas you, you knew you wanted to look at. Uh, but did your search include the entire property? Yes. So we didn't know if we would find anything in any of those areas. We just knew that that's kind of a starting point. But we indeed wanted to look at the entire three to four acres. Um, we had noted on, on different aerial images, uh, different things, any, any kind of discrepancies with the land, whether it's a well, a flower bed, um, sheds, outbuildings, the residence. So everything needed to be searched. Okay. Um, Agent Daniels, uh, in your preparation for testimony today, did you work with other members of the FBI to create an exhibit that detailed the work your team did on the Daybell property on June 9th and 10th of 2020? I did. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Well, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed States Exhibit 171. A courtesy copy was provided to the court this morning, and uh, counsel received a copy last week. <coughs> Agent Daniels, do you recognize uh, States Exhibit 171? I do. What is that? It's a thumb drive that contains the what we call the interactive uh, data. Okay. So uh, let's talk about that data. Uh, while you were on uh, the Daybell property on June 9th and 10th, uh, 
were there photographs taken of the scene that day? Yes. And as a supervisor, would you go back and review those photographs? Yes, I reviewed all the photo photographs that were taken that day or those days. Okay. Do you know approximately how many photographs were taken? I would estimate that there were five to 700 photos. Okay. Um, did you include some of those photographs in that exhibit? Yes. Uh, and have you reviewed it? Did you review the photographs that you put in that exhibit? Yes. Uh, having been on the ground on June 9th and 10th, 2020, can you say that the pictures that are in that exhibit are fair and accurate representations of what you witnessed those days? Yes. Okay. Uh, are you aware of what a ferro scanner is? Yes. Can you explain for the jury what a ferro scanner is? So a, a ferro scanner is a tool, a measuring tool that the crime scene team ERT uses when we process our crime scenes. And the ferro scanner, it has a laser and the laser is directed by a, a mirror, and the ferro scanner sits on a tripod, and it rotates in uh, 360 degrees. And wherever you put the ferro scanner, it'll take a scan using that laser, and it can take a thousand, thousands of different measurements of that area. Okay. Uh, was there a ferro scanner on the ground with your search team on June 9th and 10th? Yes, there was. Um, and is it fair to say that that ferro scanner took thousands of points of data? Yes. Okay. And, uh, it, and it took approximately 40 scans, 360 degree scans during that day, those days. Okay. Um, does the exhibit you prepared, this interactive exhibit, utilize ferro scan information for the burial sites of J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan? Yes, it does. Have you reviewed those that feral scan data for those two sites? Yes, I have. Uh, is the feral scan information on your exhibit for those two sites a fair and accurate representation of the feral scan data collected on June 9th and 10th? Yes. Agent, what is a total station tool? So total station is another measuring tool that we'll use to process our crime scenes and the the difference is the total station is kind of a point to point. It'll it'll shoot in one item of evidence or or a perimeter, so one point that you want to measure in versus like a, a thousand points of measurement. And the difference is another difference is um, we can tell it what to measure in. So if we want one specific item on a crime scene to be measured in, we can kind of dictate what that. Uh, point we want to measure in is. So hopefully that explains it. it. Is it similar to a surveyor's tool? Yes. So if you've seen people on the side of a road doing construction, um, it's it's like that. It has a, It also has a tripod um, on one end and then on the other end there's usually a person holding a pole with a prism attached and it'll shoot a laser to that person holding the pole and it'll measure with a laser out to that one point. And then the total station, another difference is the total station is good at measuring um, great lengths, and the ferro is better at measuring things that are close up. Was a total station tool used during the search of the Dado property on June 9th and 10th? It was. Uh, was any total station data used in your, in, in your exhibit? It was. Have you reviewed the total station data that's provided in that exhibit? Yes. Is it a fair and accurate representation of the total station data that was collected on June 9th and 10th? Yes. Okay. Detective, you're not a detective. Agent, sorry about that. Yes. Um, did you use a photo taken by a drone on June 9th in your interactive exhibit? Yes. Uh, you stated earlier that you did a survey of the property at the commencement of the search, correct? Correct. Uh, is it fair to say that you are familiar with the property, its landmarks, and its general layout? Yes. Uh, have you seen other aerial photos of the Dayville property? Yes. Uh, based on uh, based on you being there, based on you seeing other aerial photographs you know are associated with that property, is the drone photo you used in your exhibit a true and accurate representation of what you witnessed on June 9th and 10th of 2020? Yes, it is. Okay. So, Agent, I've... I've asked you about uh, photographs, 
ferro scan data, a total station tool data in this photo, are these, is information from those different tools collected in your exhibit? Yes, it is. Was this exhibit created to summarize the voluminous data recordings and photographs that were collected on June 9th and 10th? Yes, it was. Would it aid you and be more convenient to provide your testimony to use that exhibit than providing every single photograph, ferro scan data, and total station data collected that day? Yes, it would. Your Honor, based on Idaho Rule of Evidence 1006, the State moves to admit Exhibit 171. Any objection? Yes. All right. What's your objection, Counsel? Your Honor, I'd like to void your aid of an objection. You may. So, Agent, you indicated that this exhibit that the State is trying to introduce here uses ferro scan data and total station data and drone photos. Is that right? Correct. Okay. What training do you have as far as ferro scan data? Do you have any training on that? Just what my total station and ferro operators provide us. So, we'll do quarterly trainings within our division, and they'll give us trainings on those items. So, you testified today that you know this to be true and accurate depictions of the ferro scans. How do you know that? I mean, if you don't have any training on ferro scans. Objection misstates the testimony. That's sustained. But you can still answer as it relates to any foundational question for training on that device. So, in order to create this interactive, I sat down with our total station operator and our ferro scanner operator who were at the Daybell property on June 9th and June 10th, and they went over what was in this interactive with me and showed me the data that was in this interactive. And then I sat down with or phone called in Teams meeting with the Operational Projects Unit at FBI Laboratory, the individual who created this interactive and just kind of confirmed all of the information that was put into this interactive. Okay. So, who was it that was operating the ferro scanner? S.A. Brian Kimball. And who was operating the total station? Christopher Duham. Could you spell that name, please? Christopher, last name Duham, D-U-H-A-M-E. Okay. And are both of those guys on your team? They're both evidence response team members, yes. Okay. And who was operating the drone? It was a Rexburg PD employee, and I'd have to look at the ERT paperwork to find out, remember who that name is. Okay. But you reviewed the drone footage? Yes. Okay. And did you compare that with any satellite footage or any other footage that would give an aerial view? Did you ever fly over the area to see if that was accurate? During that week of preparation, we had a satellite image was provided to me by the FBI laboratory. I can't remember the dates of, like, whether it was Google Maps or whatever imagery it was. I don't remember the dates of those images. But, yes, I've seen aerial images of the property. And it's substantially similar to the drone photos? It was fairly similar, yes. Okay. You indicated that you had a Skype or some sort of a Zoom meeting with the Operational Projects Unit. Is that right? Yes, sir. Who is that? I'd have to get the name for you. The first name was Raya, R-A-Y-A. I'd have to look and see what the last name was. Is this a man or a woman? A woman. Okay. So what did she do for you that gave you more confidence in this particular PowerPoint or presentation that you're going to give? She's the person that actually put this interactive together at the FBI laboratory. Okay. And she works for the FBI as well? Correct. Have you ever met her before? Not in person. But you've done Zoom meetings or 
Correct. Those kinds of meetings? Yeah, correct. Okay. Phone calls, teams meetings. Teams meetings, that's what you said. Sorry. All right. Uh, based on those uh, responses, Judge, I have no, I have no objection to the, uh, to the uh, exhibit. All right. Ed, exhibit 171, then, is admitted. Your Honor, may I publish? Yes. working. It just takes a minute to spin up. You're only going to try and restart this. Detective, do you recognize this title screen? I do. I'm sorry. Agent, I apologize again. Agent, do you recognize this title screen? I do. Uh, can you just briefly describe what's on this screen? It's just an overall showing the area, and in the, the bottom portion of the screen, it shows where Lori Vallow and Alex Cox residents are with a dot, that red dot, in Rexburg, the, the city of Rexburg. And at the very top is the area that I'm going to be focused on, and that just shows where the Dayville property is um, in Fremont County. Okay. Uh, Agent, is there a pointer on the... Oh. Yes. So down here is where the Lori Vallow residence, the apartment, and Alex Cox apartment are, and then the Dayville property where we executed the search warrant on June 9th and 10th of 2020 are. And in the morning of June 9th, we, we kind of stayed, the team kind of staged at a Salem church uh, prior to the search warrant execution while local law enforcement uh, made safe the residents. And I think that's all I need to, uh, north that you'll notice is towards the top of the screen, just with the compass there. That might help us, I'll point that out once we kind of zoom in to the property. So do you recognize this property? Yes. So this is the Chad Daybell property. 
and everything on here. Um, the, the main residence, a bunch of outbuildings, chicken coop, small shed, uh, big garage, fire pit. This is the known fire pit, so one of our priority areas to search. This ends up being uh, JJ's burial site one, burial site one. This ends up being Tylee's burial, burial site two. Agent, you spoke about doing a, a preliminary site survey once you got out there. So once the team arrived, we, ERT, kind of parked our vehicles in this, this main back driveway. Uh, our photographer kind of did overall photos uh, doing a counterclockwise motion through the property this way because we knew our priority areas were all going to be kind of on this side of the re of the property, the east side of the property. So overall photo photographs were taken this way. Crime scene sign-in log started. I start kind of following the photographer, um, doing a preliminary survey of this area. And all that is is a walkthrough, a walkthrough of the, the crime scene. What am I seeing? I start doing assessments in my head. Uh, I know where the fire pit is. I had two people going to the fire pit anyway to start some assessments of their own, ERT people. Um, so they're going to start assessing that. But I'm going to start doing some assessments too. What does the fire pit look like? Can I determine where the pet cemetery is? Um, and then gradually work my way up to the pond to see what's over on this side. Okay. Um. Were you part of a search of the house that day? Yes. Okay. What do you see here? This is one of the ERT photos that we took, and it's just showing an overall photo of, of the front door of the residence. And... This, what's there's a, a photo number assigned to, the, to these can you state the number and, and then briefly describe what the, the photo shows so this is photo number 492 um, one thing to note though is sometimes these photo numbers don't match what uh, the ERT team's photo numbers are okay so I just want to make a little clarification and then the photo this is just showing a vantage point photo so from the upper bedroom of the residence which was right there this is just a a photo showing that from this bedroom on the upper story of this this how the house you could look out and oversee where jj's burial was right at the base of that tree basically behind out over that area can you describe what was you saw in this photo? And this is that same, from the same window, just a different view. This is facing east, just overlooking. Uh, Tylee's burial is going to be just on the other side of this bigger garage or barn. So that's just a, just a vantage point, just showing what, what the residents could see. And this was from that same upper bedroom, correct? Same, same upper bedroom window right about there on the top. And where is this located? And now this is the kitchen window, and it's going to be somewhere in that vicinity. And so it's just showing, just kind of from, from these windows along the east side of the residence, looking towards where eventually we'll show you some of the, the burial sites, but it's looking towards the burial sites, that, that east side of the property just kind of what the residents would have had a view of. So this is more towards the fire pit and where Tylee's burial site will be. And that's the opening of the that, that garage right there. You can see that garage right there. And we'll show you some photos of the garage. That'll be important in a little bit. Okay. And then where was this photo taken? And there's two bedrooms along this, this side. There's a southeastern bedroom down here, a window right here. And then just north of it, there's another bedroom. So this is from that bedroom, the second bedroom from the southeast corner. So it's just right about there. 
just showing the view that that bedroom window would have of the property facing those burials. So up there would have been JJ's burial, and over here would have been Tylee's burial and the fire pit. Agent, I'm gonna we're gonna discuss the fire pit. Um, can you describe what what we're looking at in the photo that's been listed as 27? So this is just one of our entry photos or overall photos. So what's important about this is we haven't touched the area. Um, so doing that quick assessment, right as we came around the corner of the of the property. This right here is a little statue of a dog, and that allowed me to kind of make a quick assessment. Well, that's probably where a pet cemetery is. And then if you look at the ground, I like this photo because it, it obviously when you're there in person, it looks a little better. But this one at least allows you to see kind of um, some disturbances in the ground, or the ground just looks a little different right here. So standing out there, I could see kind of what I thought in front of that statue. It looked like there could be a little burial. And then in this whole area, there just seemed like there could be some other depressions or disturbances in this ground right here. So initial, so pretty, pretty quickly, I just made a little square around this area and said, this is what we're going to call our initial pet cemetery area. And so fairly quickly, I was able to get a team to start processing this area for the pet cemetery. And then you can see in the background, we've got our fire pit ring over here, some debris. And then in a little bit, you'll see some uh, fluorescent streamers that start to show up. And we can talk about that in another picture. But, but those will just be some grids that we start setting up. When you say grids, what do you mean by grids? So a lot of times when we do search, especially in a, in, on a big property, there's not really any reference points out there. So we like to establish some kind of a grid system so that later for when we go to court where I'm trying to show a jury what we did on a property, um, we can kind of make it make sense to everybody. And if we find some evidence in that grid, we can kind of give you a little bit better detail as to on this big property right here is where we found it. And so hopefully we'll see if that makes sense in a minute. And so this picture just shows a little bit trying to make sense of, so our, our two people that went over to that fire pit to assess the fire pit, one of our concerns was this was June 9th um, of 2020 and our time of interest that these two kids went missing was like September of 2019. And we didn't know, is the fire pit today, did it look like that back in uh, September of 2019? And so what, while they're assessing, they went over to that fire pit and started assessing, they started seeing ash on the ground outside the fire pit. So that's what they made their grid, they made the grid go extend beyond the actual fire pit ring. And that grid is basically going around the entire area where they saw like ash on the ground. So that's what made them determine how to build that grid system. And then while they were building that grid system, they noticed a little silver charm. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And Agent, what, uh, describe what you uh, saw that day that's it's listed as photo 33. And so this is just a close-up photo of the fire pit ring as we saw it. So before we've touched it, this is what it looked like. Center block ring. These are just some branches that were in it, and we haven't done anything to it yet. And then in a minute, I'll talk about kind of how we would process that. But that one's just to give you an idea of what it looked like when we first got there. And now we've process, we're start, we've started processing that initial layer's gone. And how we want to process the fire pit is we just want to go layer by layer down. And this is going to take a sifting process. So our team, it's going to take a team. 
So we're going to test start using rakes to rake through it to see if we notice anything. We're going to use shovels. We're going to scoop the soil, debris, whatever's in there into buckets. And we have a picture that I, I, we chose this one just because it showed a bucket. But that's the kind of bucket we would use to scoop the debris in. And then a little bit away from here, we will put down a tarp, so a clean tarp. And then we'll have like these wooden um, sifter screens. And they'll have like a mesh wire screen on them. And then a team member will pour the soil onto that mesh screen while another team member is shaking it back and forth. And so the soil falls through. And then you try to catch any potential evidence pieces on top, whether that's potential bone, whether it ends up being jewelry, um, or anything else that could be significant. And then our team members will catch that and decide if it's evidence or not. Uh, and to your knowledge, were any items collected for evidence from that fire pit on June 9th and 10th? Yes. So, so from the fire pit on this day, from all the grids, um, quadrants on this day, uh, we collected suspected bone fragments. And I think we have a picture that will show you those, those uh, quadrants in a second. So from all of them, we got suspected bone fragments. We got um, suspected organic material from this fire pit. And we don't, at the time, we're, when we're processing it, we don't know what that is. But we just see it, and we're like, hey, this looks like it could be organic material. So we'll collect it, and then somebody else has to send it to a lab to try to verify that. And then an important piece that we found out of here uh, was, a, was a chain. Pura Vita chain comes out Agent, of this. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna. Oh, I'm gonna stop you, and I'll I'll ask some questions and, and uh, as we go through. But uh, were there any other items collected from this fire pit that day? There was just the miscellaneous pieces of cloth and fabric. Um, and again, at the time, we don't necessarily know at this point from our standpoint is this important, not important. But when we see those things, we just collect them. Okay, thanks. And Agent, what what are we seeing in in this photo? This is just a photo to show you as it's, you know, we're probably near, nearing completion of the processing the fire pit. So it's just showing how it's getting, we're, we're, it's getting cleaned up. And you can kind of see how the rake's been gone, gone through there. And then an important thing to note for the fire pit was just as the team was processing this fire pit, they could smell like the, the, the chemical smell or accelerant smell was strong. And that was something just to, to remember. Um, it, it was almost overpowering at times. And people were talking about, you know, do we need to wear masks, like, so they could smell that? And we did take a soil sample from that um, fire pit so that that could potentially be tested later, too. OK. And then from the sifting operation in the fire pit, this Pura Vida chain was collected. Agent, when you say Pura Vita, what does that mean? So on this, on this silver part of the chain right there, that's the description on it. So it says Pura Vita okay. on that chain right there. And was that located actually in the fire pit? That was inside the fire pit, and it was collected f while doing that sifting operation that I described before. And then this, oh, I'm sorry. No, I was just, uh, Agent, can you describe what we're seeing in photos 46? And then this is just a longer shot of the silver charm we found. I know it's hard to see, but that's because it's a long, long shot of it. Um, and it's, it was, it was found kind of in this area over here. Um, so here's the fire pit. It was found quite a distance over here. Agent, was this an area where the, uh, the total station was used to make measurements? Yes, it was. Are those those measurements? Those are those measurements. OK. So when we talked earlier about the team getting there, they created, the team created this grid. And, the, and these squares become, become the quadrants. And they created this because they found that ash on the ground in these areas. And again, thinking, well, in 2019, this fire pit potentially wasn't there. What if it was over here? But we found all the ash outside of this fire pit in these areas. So the teammates, the team members, they're the ones that created these grids. 
while they were setting up the grids, that's when they noticed that silver charm right there. So it just caught their attention. And it's just one of those things at first. And that was actually fairly early in the day that we saw that because that's when the grids were getting set up. But it's just like, hey, that doesn't, that doesn't fit. Why is that way out here in the middle of this field? Okay, Agent, is what are we seeing in this next photo? So now we're just doing closer up views. Usually we start with a longer view of a piece of evidence. And then we do medium shots, close up shots, and close up with scale shots. And that's what you're about to see. Okay. So that's just a, 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 closer, a closer, view of the last yeah, photo. closer up shot of it. And these are all this? still, these are all still with it in place. Okay. And now we've moved it. And now we just put added the scale to it. Okay. And then, oh, and then over on the side over here, we didn't get a, a specific measurement of the charm. But what we did do, because we had our total station, the, divide, the measurement tool that can measure specific points, our, we use our total station when we do grids in the middle of fields and whatnot where there's no reference points. We use total station to map in any grids we make. So whether it's a burial and we do, we'll, we'll map in with total station the specific points of that burial so we know where Tylee's burial is on that property. And then we use total station to map in each one of these corners of our grid so we know where that is and then we total stationed in each end of the center blocks and that's why those center blocks are kind of all noted on there and so now we could potentially take a measurement from this uh, our, our grid point is what we did we took that measurement to one of the center blocks of the fire pit to at least give everybody the approximate so that's from our grid the northeast corner of our grid to one of the center blocks of the fire pit. So we at least have an approximate distance as to where that charm was. But that's not a measurement to the charm. Okay. Uh, and that's just the same charm uh, placed over some paper? Correct. Okay. Your Honor, I'm about to move on to an another section. I wonder if this would be a time to take the mid-afternoon break. I think it would be a good time for that, Mr. Wood. <coughs> All right, we'll go ahead and take our mid-afternoon break for 20 minutes or so. All right, please. Thank you. Please be seated. You can have the jurors brought in.
Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All right, we'll go back on the record. KCR 2221-1624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. Mr. Wood is in cross or, uh, direct examination of your witness, Mr. Daniels. If you'd like to continue with direct, you may. Thank you. Agent Daniels, uh, just before we broke for a break, you had testified about items that were found in the fire pit, correct? Correct. Uh, when items... When, what happened to those items? All evidence items seized at the end of the both days were turned over to the Rexburg Police Department. Okay. Um, and was there a, a log of that kept? There was. Okay. Uh, Agent, can you, we're going to talk about the location where Tylee Ryan was found. Um, can you describe uh, what you witnessed uh, in relation to photo 218? So this photo here is showing, there's that dog statue that we saw earlier when the uh, land, it was kind of an overall photo we saw earlier. And this one shows, this was kind of that initial area that I called the pet cemetery. And now the tractor, the backhoe, has already excavated that initial area in front of the dog statue. And there were two animal remains that were found, a dog that was right in front of the statue, and then a cat remains were found approximately somewhere over here. Um, no other human remains were found in this initial area. And at this point, the backhoe is it would extend that arm out and then it would kind of pull back that arm towards it, towards the tractor. And so it's just kind of excavating this area. And that where the tractor's at is north of where this initial pet cemetery is. So right now that tractor is excavating <laughs> north of the initial pet cemetery area here. Uh, Agent, was there a reason you used a backhoe? At this point, since we hadn't found anything in this initial area, and, and we did use the tractor here also, but first off, um, our process, and I guess I should need to describe that process. So the process we used for this pet cemetery, um, where I had seen this dog statue, in front of that dog statue was some disturbed areas that I thought could be burial sites. So we initially had a team pro start processing that area, and we just wanted to kind of go layer by layer. Sorry about that. It's all right. We'll get that fixed. Thank you, Madam Clerk. All right. Um, I had asked you why you're using a backhoe, if you want to continue answering that. So, so initially, to process this, air, this area, we started with hand tools. And we started by processing where we thought that pet cemetery area was with hand tools. And we kind of wanted to go layer by layer down. And we found the animal remains by using hand tools. And then once we didn't find any human remains, we started using the backhoe just to save time and try to find, see if there was something there. And once we excavated deeper in that initial area, we just had to start expanding um, to try to clear more, more ground. And that was essentially why we started using the backhoe, just to cover more area. Okay. And tell us what you observed in the photo that's been designated 222. And so as that tractor was excavating to the north of that initial pet cemetery area, this is one of the first bone pieces 
that, that became excavated and it's kind of a vertebrae, it's a vertebrae piece. And at this time is when we stopped using the backhoe. We couldn't tell at this time if this were, was human remains. But at this time, besides the bone being found, I could smell an odor that I could associate with human remains decomposing. And so between this bone being found and there was another, a second bone that was found also, and that odor that I can associate with human decomposition, the decision was made not to use the tractor anymore. And in this air, this new area where these bones were found, that's what we started excavating, which is hand tools. And, and Detective, you, you talk about this smell. Um, you've been involved in previous uh, searches for for human beings, correct? For correct. deceased. Correct. Uh, and and is it a, is there a specific smell to you of of a decomposing body? Yes. Okay. And just I'm sorry, just to just to clarify, it was around the time you found this bone that you started smelling that. Yes. Okay. So as we were assessing this bone and a second bone, that's when that smell of decomposition, we could smell that, that smell. And that's when the decision was made not to use the tractor anymore and to start processing this area uh, with hand tools. And Agent, can you describe what we're seeing in this photo? And this photo, we really want to highlight these bricks that were uncovered by the tractor and these bricks were in the vicinity of where we end up finding Ty Lee's grave site and then this area right here ends up being at this point we don't know but this ends up being Ty Lee's grave site or what we call grave site number two on scene and at this point could you still smell that that same odor. Yes, and the the odor just the odor just gets uh, more s stronger as we start excavating this area. And can you describe what what we're seeing in this photo? This, I think my laser pointer is giving out on me. Yeah, I don't know if you guys have another laser pointer killed it unless I've done something to it now it's working oh. I'll keep going with this one I'll tell you now this right here is another bone and then this area just shows the area where we eventually determine is Tylee's um, burial site Can you describe what we see in this photo? It's harder, hard to see in this one, but right there is a bigger white bone piece. And that was kind of the first, what ends up being the, the first pieces of Tylee that we excavate um, that's going to lead us to, to identify this as burial site number two where Tylee was buried. But at this point, we still didn't know on scene. But that bigger bone was a, a stronger indication that we're in, we're, in, we're in the right spot. And then we still see the, the uh, bricks that were near, you know, that were near where her burial site was and could have been placed on top of her remains. And Agent, what kind of tools were, uh, were being used you can kind of see some of the tools we had. So we had like a smaller little pick. And then that one's a, a trowel. So at this stage, we probably were using that trowel for the most part. And a lot of our excavations, we use uh, these little trowel tools. Okay. And uh, who, who at this point 
w was helping at that site. Do you recall? On this on this site, besides the evidence response team members, we had about eight. We had Rexburg Police Department members. We had Fremont County Sheriff's Department members. We had other uh, FBI employees helping on this scene. And then I, I would just refer everybody to the crime scene sign-in logs to see who else was on scene at this point. Okay. And what are we seeing in photo 255? So now we've excavated further. Here's that uh, white, bigger white bone that was in that last photo. And now we're just, we've excavated a little, we're, we're attempting to excavate um, the, this, this human remains. And at this point, we still didn't have a determination that this was human remains. So we didn't know if this was animal or human. We're just trying to excavate it, get it out of the ground, and see if we had a forensic an or we had an anthropologist on scene, and we were going to try to get her to determine if we if this was human or not. Okay, and I'm actually going to go back to the previous photo. Uh, as you were digging through this, did, was there anything remarkable to you about the soil uh, as you were digging? Oh, as we were trying to excavate this area, what we noticed was on the east side, so this lip right in here, this was harder for us to excavate through. And it had some kind of like a hard substance, similar to like a, a concrete type substance. Um, and so we had a difficult time just kind of getting through those layers and I think there's a better uh, photo later. Okay. But we ended up, ultimately we end up using the, the backhoe to kind of pull that kind of crusty layer away from these remains. And I think we'll have a better photo later to show. And Judge, if, if we can get him a different laser pointer, I'm having a really hard time following what he's looking at and things that he's pointing to. All right, we do have an alternate one there. <clears throat> Thank you. I'll try to use this one again. It's, it's working now, but it might go out. And then the other things to point out from this photo is just the kind of how the ends are look charred, and then the pink flesh versus some charred flesh. Yeah, it's going. This laser pointer is going out again. It works for a second, and then it goes out. All right. If you'll give us a moment, I think we're working on it. Okay, there's a new one being delivered. It may take a few minutes. Maybe you can direct some additional questioning that doesn't require him to point for the moment, Mr. Wood. Okay. Agent, what uh, can you describe what you observed in this photo? We finally were able to remove the pieces that were in that last photo you saw. And this, these are the pieces, the first pieces of Tylee's remains that we removed at the end of our uh, day one, so June 9th of 2020. And, these, and this is the point where we did identify them as human remains. And that became, that spot that we were just looking at all the photos, that became uh, burial site number two for us, or, or Tylee's burial site. And so at that point, we kind of established a new uh, perimeter around her burial site, and then came up with a better kind of excavation plan. Um, we can see it's on a blue tarp. Was that separated from the burial? Yeah, so we just had a tarp, you know, next to where the remains were excavated, put the pieces, you know, nearby, and then you can kind of see some of the charring on the remains some of the pink flesh that's still there. Okay. And that's one reason, that, I mean, this, this site, this burial was definitely the more difficult site for us to process um, just because of the way they were dismembered. We had a difficult time just trying to establish what are we, 
what are we looking at? How how was this burial done? So this was this this site definitely gave everybody that was trying to excavate it, you know, made it harder for us. It made it complex. Okay. Is this a moment? I think the bailiff's got oh. a new laser pointer here. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for the help. Okay. And in this photo is, uh, can you describe what's what you observed there? And this is just a closer up view of all of the initial pieces that were identified as Tylee. And you can see the bigger bones that were sticking out of the ground. And again, the hard part for us was just that initial excavation, like how do we, removing those was difficult. They didn't want to come out of the ground. And we, and we find out later it's because they were all just kind of melted together. And so it was just, it wasn't a standard um, excavation of remains. And by the next day, we kind of understand a little better why. Can, can you describe what's, what you observed in photo 262? This is after we had excavated those last pieces of Tylee. This is kind of what that burial site then looked like at the end of day one. So at the end of the day, you had uh, taken portions out of the ground. Uh, what happened with those? So the coroner, uh, the pieces of Tylee that were on that blue tarp, were then turned over to the coroner, so placed in a body bag, and then the coroner would have been responsible for removing those from the scene. Okay. And so this photo was taken at the end, you said of... So after that. those after those pieces were removed, then this is what the burial site then looked like. Okay. And can you describe what's... Uh, in this photograph and basically at the end of june 9th 2020 um, we ended our day having established okay this is where tylee's remains are this is burial site two we we got those pieces out those first pieces that helped us identify okay this is where it's at um, the coroner took them and so now we're kind of at the end of the day before we kind of continue excavating that burial now now that we know okay that's what this is um this is just our where we left off for the day so we're basically just secured everything for burial site two where tylee was buried and we secured it all for, for that day and now uh rexburg pd fremont county sheriff's office are going to secure the scene overnight and then the next day june 10th we're going to come back and we'll process uh, one of the things we'll do is come back and prioritize processing, excavating the entire all those remains that are still left in that burial. And approximately what time did you um, uh, secure the scene and then leave on June 9th? I'd have to look at our logs to be positive, but it was probably approximately five something p.m. Okay. And what is this a picture of? Now this is June 10th, 2020. So this is uh, an overall photo before we start the second day. So this is just how our scene is looking um, before we start processing. Okay. So where these orange stakes are located, those are the stakes that I put down just to indicate a new, this is now the perimeter around burial site number two where Tylee's remains were located. And now for today, we're going to excavate that just kind of a layer by layer down until we found all of the remains. And as you as you went through this excavation process, both on the 9th and 10th, uh, were individuals sifting some of the soil that you were going through? Oh, yes. So this picture is a good picture to show what our sifters look like, the wooden sifters. And on the inside of these sifters is a mesh wire screen. So that's a sifter right there. And then again, there's our buckets. Um, at each of the burial sites, there was a sifting operation. At the fire pit, there was a sifting operation. 
and at JJ's uh, burial site, there was a sifting operation. Again, just looking for evidence, uh, pieces of human remains, uh, just to make sure we've, we've collected everything. And can you describe what we see in this photo? So now we've uncovered the burial site. And again, you can see this, the orange stakes kind of represent the perimeter of the new burial site number two, where Tali's remains were located. And now today we're just going to do kind of a layer, a layered approach, excavate down, um, take over all photos of each of these layers, stop and take the ferro scans so that we can kind of see what that's going to look like, the different measurements of the, of the, to get the depths of where we're at. Um, if we see something significant, then we'll stop and take photos and scans. Um, so only really if we see something significant and the team leaders, someone like myself, can decide if we need to stop and take photos and scans. Um, and this one, was, again, this one was a difficult one, uh, and we'll, we'll probably see why in some other photos, because it just wasn't, I hate to say normal, but it just wasn't like a normal um, burial. Can you describe what we were observing in photo 368? So this is a good photo that shows kind of our difficulty we had excavating. So on the this this side here, you can see how we were able to kind of get uh, excavate deeper. And so this side's kind of deep. And then this side up here, we, we were hardly able to um, excavate and go go deep up here. And that's because this lip right here, and you can kind of see the texture to it, that's the side that had what I'm describing as kind of that concrete type material. So I can't say for sure if somebody was trying to cover this area, the burial, with some kind of concrete substance, but it was real close to where this burial is, right? Um, okay. we, we ended up taking samples of that substance. So we took a sample of that. And then on the, obviously, what, what stands out is at the bottom of this and this, it ends up being, we couldn't figure this out, like as we're hitting this top portion here, it's, we could tell it was kind of a organic material. But again, to, to your eye, as you're hitting this, you're like, what is this? This doesn't seem human. But what it ends up being is that is kind of the melted flesh of a human. Uh, but it took us a while to understand that or realize that. But this, this ends up being just a mass of a human, you know, dismembered, melted mass. And then finally, when you get to the bottom here, you kind of start understanding, oh, there's a melted green five gallon bucket. There's the skull finally down at the bottom. And those are really kind of, in my mind, what stood out finally, like, oh, wow, like that is a human. So this was kind of a, it took a while, even for investigators, it took a while for us to wrap our head around what what happened here? What is this? Can you describe what we see in this photograph? And so with that, that lip that was over here that was hard to break through or excavate, we ended up getting the tractor and kind of pulling back that lip of that crusty, hard material. And then we were finally able to kind of get in there and get deeper down. So we finally excavated around. And we ended up like kind of pedestooling out this human, these human remains. So it ends up being this, you, you can now see this, this, this pedestaled out human remains. And this is what, this is what ultimately, this is what we want to do. We want to be able to show you guys this. We want to be able to show everybody this is how these remains were buried, just to hopefully show the story of what happened here. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, you're fine. Um, oh, okay. Then what do we see in this photograph? And now we're just looking, now that we've got it kind of pedestaled, we've gone deeper on all sides of this, um, the human remains. I mean, this is what we were, what we were seeing. And you can still kind of see a skull at the bottom here, and then this melted plastic bucket here. And what is this a photo of? And so now we're just trying to get better photos of what we could identify, what made sense to us. And that was really the skull and then that bucket that was just melted. 
Is that just a different angle? Just a different angle, trying to get as low inside the barrel as we could, just to show what that, what's what did that look like when whoever did this, you know, put those remains in here. So just trying to show us, us everybody, what what was this like? And then it's and then at some point, oh, oh, was, at, at some point we just had to make the decision. We've done, we've done everything we could to show that story of how these remains were put in there, buried. Um, and then in the decision we just made, we had to lift them out, try to lift them out. So when the, the team tried to lift those remains out, that's when they just fell apart. So we ended up that mass of melted, dismembered remains just kind of fell apart. And that this picture just shows what was, you know, what it looked like once the remains were removed. So now this is picture 400. Uh, once those remains were removed, what what was done with them? There was a coroner's body bag was placed nearby, and so the remains were placed inside the body bag. And I think we'll have photos of that. And then uh, the anthropologist and coroner just kind of separated uh, those remains just so that they could kind of give us a, a better inventory as to what parts we had so that I would know how many parts pieces are we still looking for or do we think we have everything that, that we need to take. Agent, I, I should have asked this earlier, but on June 10th, the second day of the search, do you recall approximately what time you began working on this site again? It would have just been the early morning. It would, probably would have been 7 something a.m. Okay. And on my logs, it would say the exact time. Okay. And do you recall approximately what time uh, that mass of remains was removed? I don't remember the exact time. And I, I probably noted it on my on my uh, logs that I keep, and I might I probably noted when the coroner took the remains on my logs, but I'd have to review those. Okay. What is in photo four zero three? So once we remove those remains, these are all the pieces placed on the coroner's body bag, and that's just showing them placed in there kind of as, as one mass. And four, photo 407, what are we observing here? So now it's just the close-up view. Once, once the anthropologist and coroner started separating the mass, now you could finally start seeing, you know, pieces that are at least identifiable. Okay, now it's looking more human. So now there's, you know, there's that skull. So now you're starting to see the P and that was part of that inventory. So we wanted them to do an inventory. I wanted them to do an inventory so that I knew, you know, are we looking for, it, could there possibly be another uh, burial? Are all the pieces uh, human remains in one burial? Or are we looking for another burial? So we wanted to kind of have that um, knowledge. Okay. And then these are those bricks that we've seen in other photos that were near where Tylee's remains were buried. So it was possible that these bricks were on top of her remains. Um, and we'll see in burial one when we get there, there were stones on top of JJ's remains. So it's possible these bricks could have been on Tylee's remains. So we wanted to collect these just in case. Okay, and that was in photo 414, correct? I'd have to go back and see what the number was on. on well, based, based on your presentation, on your presentation, it's listed as photo 414, correct? Oh, correct. And then what are we seeing in photo 444? So at each of the burials, this, this is what we did. After we collected all of the human remains, the last step we did was we had the backhoe um, dig deeper in each of the, the burials and a little bit can go a little bit wider just to ensure we didn't have any other uh, human remains in that area. And that was especially important on JJ's burial because when we did when we had excavated JJ's was the first burial we found 
and we wanted to make sure uh, Tylee's remains weren't in that same area. So that was just something we did extra to make sure there weren't any other remains. Okay. And was anything else located? No. Okay. Uh, we mentioned feral scanners earlier, uh, and you mentioned uh, feral scans at that specific site. Uh, can you tell us what we're seeing in this first photo? Yeah, so what I mentioned just a little bit ago, when we do these excavations, um, and it's kind of at the team leader's discretion, but wherever, whenever you see something significant, you want to stop and take photographs of that layer, and you want to do scans, like ferro scans, of that layer. And that's what this represents right here. So over on the, the right side, we have a photograph. We call it layer A, and that's what this photograph is. And then we also, after the photographer took a photo, we had our ferro scanner set the, the on set his tripet, tripod in the area, and then he took a ferro scan. And then the ferro scanner was the one that does the 360 degree, it turns around, and it takes thousands of measurements. And from those thousands of measurements, it creates this little image of the burial. And so that's what you're seeing down in the bottom. So when we, now that we, since we've clicked on this, this photograph up here, which is this photograph, you're seeing this A right here represents the lowest depth of that image right there. And is it, are we seeing the same thing here, just at a lower depth? Yep, so now he's clicked on picture B which is your big picture here. And then now he's you're just seeing where that the lowest depth of this picture is represented in the graph down here. Okay. And so that's at that at that point it's approximately a, a foot and a half, correct? Correct. And we didn't give any precise measurements. We just left it as 1 foot, 2 foot, 3 foot, and you just get an idea as to where that is. Okay. Layer C uh, approximately how deep was that? So layer C is right there close to two feet deep. Okay, and then layer D? Just under the two foot mark. Okay, and then finally layer E, once it's removed, how deep was that? Yep, again, just under the two feet mark. Uh, Detective, as part of your search, uh, did uh, did you search the this shed and barn that's highlighted by the mouse? Yes. Okay. Uh, can you describe what we're seeing in photograph seventy nine? This is the garage door opening, or shed barn opening and it's located right here on this side. So if you're walking from the residence over here, this is the first entryway you could go into to get into this area. Okay. And so here's the entryway. And as you walked in, what did you see? So one of the things, knowing that we're dealing with a burial, two burials, um, one of the things we're interested in is any tools. So if I was burying somebody, what tools would I need to do this? Or in the case of Tylee, if I burn Tylee, if I dismember Tylee, what would I need to do that? So as I'm doing a survey of this garage, those are the tools that I'm looking for. So one of the things as we walked into this garage, from that open garage you saw in the first photo, there's a bunch of tools uh, up against the wall right here. And this is kind of an as-is photograph. So right now you're seeing the tools as they were on June 9th. Okay, and what are we seeing in photo 83? So now we've just turned, there's the open garage, here's those tools kind of as is up against the wall over there. Okay. And we'll gradually get clo closer up views of them. Are those those same tools? Yep, these are the same tools. Some of them are inside this purple little crate. And what's significant about this photograph? 
So this becomes more important. These are the tools that we chose to take as evidence. And obviously, because they could be the tools that I would use to bury somebody or do something harmful to somebody for this given scene. So we've got the pick, we've got shovels. And again, a lot of times I just base this on my experience. And unfortunately, these are the things that I train in. So I buried a lot of things. Um, but these, these tools in particular, you can see maybe they were used in a fire. Um, a lot of them are dirty. So those are clues. And you stated you collected those as evidence? Yeah, these ones right here were collected as evidence. So that's why that photo is important. And what uh, what was done with those after you collected them as evidence? I would have, we, we seized those. I seized those at the end of the day. And then I would have handed those to, um, released those to the Rexburg Police Department. Okay. And this is just a close-up picture of the pickaxe. And this was one of the items you seized? Correct. And then you can see just some of the why we might have collected it, because it's showing some of the stuff, material, that could be on the pickaxe. And what was uh, in photo 239? These are two of the shovels that were seized. They were part of that group of, of tools in that last uh, couple photos back. Um, and again, this is just a closer up showing some of the, uh, how dirty they were and potentially, you know, could be ash, could be other things on the shovels. So potential reasons to collect them. And these were, but so these were also collected as evidence and turned over to Rexburg? Correct. Or I, sh I should say the Rexburg police. Correct. Now, now, when you walked into that garage from the, the picture that showed the open garage. Your Honor, I'm going to object. There's no question here. I'll, so I'll ask a question. Uh, what did you observe in photo 451? So these are items that we collected as evidence from the garage. Okay. And again, uh, did you turn those over to the Rexburg police? Yes. At the end of the day, I would have seized these, and then we turned them over to the Rexburg police department. And these tools are the ones that, as you walked into the garage and you make a left, these are the tools that were in that area. Okay. And what is photo 237 of? This is just an overall photo, uh, photo of some of the tools in this west side of the garage right here. So not all of these tools were collected as evidence but we just took an overall photo of some of the tools in the west side of that garage. Okay. And what, what did you observe in photo 437? These were just a group of tools, so an overall photo of tools that were in the southeast corner of the garage behind a door right in that area. Okay, and did you seize those? Not all of these were seized. Some of them were, and we'll see a photo of the ones that were seized. Okay. Is Can you describe photo 438? These were the items that were seized. So the shovel from the shovel over shovel, the two axes, the post hole digger, and the hoe. Those were seized and handed over to Rexburg Police Department. Okay. And what did, can you describe what you observed in photo 416? These bricks were similar in nature to the bricks found near Tylee's grave site. We've already shown you pictures of those. These bricks were located to the north side of this smaller shed, and we took samples of those bricks. And those would have been handed over to the Rexburg Police Department. My agent, um, I was speaking with you about site one. Uh, can you tell us what we're looking at in photo 146? This is just an overall photo showing what, as you walk towards where JG's burial site is, which was our first burial site, the first um, human remains that were identified on 
June 9th, 2020, what it looked like as you start walking towards it. And it's in the northeast. It's right about here, the northeast corner of this pond. And what did you observe in photo 149? In 149, just you're, we're getting closer now. And so basically, it's easier to see when you're there, but it's taller vegetation, taller grasses, vegetation around the burial. And then right here in the center, there's like a shorter vegetation on top of a raised berm. So as you're walking out there looking for a hidden grave, like that's, that's what you're looking for. And, and that was observed, there was a berm observable to you. Right. So if you're in, in person, then you, as you get closer to that, you would see a raised berm in this case. So there'd be a raised berm with less vegetation than the surrounding vegetation that you can see in this photo, how it's really high. And is this a and this photo is a better, of 153? Is, uh, can you describe what you're seeing there? This is a better photo because now we're getting closer. And so now you can see how high the vegetation is surrounding this part right here and that in when you're in person you can kind of get a better idea of the raised nature of this berm and then you can see how this is the vegetation's thinner up on top and so being there it just stands out to you like this is an odd an odd location an odd thing in photo 156 uh what is that a photo of it's the same, what ends up being a burial. It's just closer up of that berm, just kind of showing you the, the shorter vegetation on top. And photo 157, what, what, uh, can you describe what you observed there? This is just an overall photo. It's kind of on the opposite side of the pond, and our burial site was right over there somewhere. And, oh, oh, you're good. I was just going to say, our, uh, from this picture, you can also see how uh, the fire pit area was over this way, and the Tylee's grave site, it's hard to see, but it would be over that way. In photo 166, uh, what was going on there? So now we've kind of identified our area of where that berm was, and so again, what we want to do is we want to just process this layer by layer. Uh, just going down and if we see anything significant again we want to stop take photographs do those ferro scans and just document how how did whoever do this how did they bury this person and at this point I mean we honestly didn't know if this was a burial or not but that's our you know we have to do this process and figure out what what's here and the the oh. pink ribbon that we see is that is that where you've credited it off that's just yeah that's just one of our perimeter markings and then this area is going to be where the burial is and we've already taken some of the vegetation off um, from above the burial site can you describe what we're seeing in 168 so now we've just gone another layer down we've taken the vegetation off and now you're starting to see stones kind of protruding through the through the soil can you describe what we're seeing in photo 173 so now this starts to get really interesting because now we've got these stones cement blocks that are just really precisely placed in this part of the yard and you're starting to see cut roots especially the bigger ones um, but you're starting to see cut roots and then the, these stones just precisely placed and then this this ends up being planks and we'll get to that um, but that's the significant like something significant that's significant so we just want to stop take photos take scans um, but now that's that's just screaming to me as a team leader like something's odd here like this probably shouldn't be here uh, Mr. Wood, could we have a brief sidebar here? Yeah.
I had two. I had two other ones. That one must have gone to this. Thank you. All right, the court had a brief sidebar with counsel just to discuss uh, scheduling and where we're at for the day. It appears there's uh, still some time remaining with this witness, and so I think it would be best if we conclude for the day, and then you can continue again with additional direct examination of this witness in the morning, Mr. Wood. Very well. Thank you, Your Honor.